We're going to go ahead and start our going forward in. Do you want like we need to have that video on, or is it actually going to move over there? Yes, all of us are there. there. Yeah. And you all can see. It'll be helpful to have your video on when you pre like, 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 for the record. Okay. Oh, when you. Okay. So we've got yeah, to have you. Since we're about to be all call in for the video. I'm going to go ahead and open the meeting. We started recording, so I want to welcome everyone to the November 17th. 2022 um, hybrid session. Our hybrid approach where meetings are held using web and with a physical presence here at the boards and commissions room in City Hall is designed to meet the governor and executive orders for meetings during the COVID pandemic. Our meetings are being recorded, which will be posted later on our website. So the meeting agenda today, we have from 10.30 until noon, we'll be conducting our public trust review of a proposed allocation at 200 Taylor Avenue North. And that's again from 10.30 until noon. Uh, we have lunch from noon until one, and then from one until 2.30, we'll be uh, receiving a presentation by Victoria Lantain, a PhD candidate at North Carolina State University, who's going to be talking about equitable outcomes in the design of the built environment. Um, our meeting format for this morning's meeting <clears throat> will receive a, a presentation from the development team on their proposed allocation. Um, there will be an opportunity for public benefit, and uh, excuse me, for public comment. There will be an opportunity for public benefit, but we'll be doing that at a different meeting. But there is an opportunity for public comment and we'll recognize people for public comment after uh, the presentation team makes its uh, presentation. Um, followed by, uh, there will be an opportunity for commissioners to ask clarifying questions and then followed by a discussion and um, a summary of potential action today, which will be led by Amani Layton Cody. For people who are attending and want to make a public comment, we offer two minutes. There's a hand raising function in the WebEx meeting, and we'll make sure that we recognize anybody who raised their hand. Um, we'll likely call on uh, Beverly Burnett as well to make a few comments um, as a representative from SDOT and leading the vacation process for them. I want to go ahead and start with uh, introductions of commissioners. Why don't we start? online first and then we'll have commissioners introduce themselves uh one quick thing uh commissioners would you please make sure to introduce yourself um your role on commission and any potential disclosures um one last thing when you are speaking if you could make sure that you turn your camera on because it helps not only with our record but it helps um, staff to get a, a better picture of the uh, proceedings so i will Stop there and start with in alphabetical order with Matt Alves. Hi, my name is Matt Alves. Um, I'm one of the architect commissioners. And Elaine. Hi, Elaine Wine, uh, one of the architect commissioners. Thanks. And Benita. Hello, Vanita Sidhu, Landscape Architect Commissioner and Chair. Um, and I just wanted to disclose that um, BMR is a client of my firm, Site Workshop, though I am not personally working on any projects with them. Thanks, Vanita. And then commissioners in the room, starting with Elizabeth Connor. Elizabeth Connor, good morning. Um, I'm the main artist commissioner. Hi, good morning. Uh, Adam Amran, I'm the Urban Planning Commissioner. I wanted to say also thank you for joining us. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jill Crary, at large commissioner. Uh, Amalia Layton Cody, Transportation Planner Commissioner and Action Taker for today. And I'm Michael Jenkins, I'm uh, Design Commission Director. And Valerie Kinas, I'm Staff and And Wendy? Wendy Gay, Design Commission Staff. Thanks, Wendy. Um, we have a number of people in the room. We can do a quick round of introductions. Um, Jack, do you want to? Sure, Jack McCullough. I'm the attorney for Biomed. I'm Brad Rock with Biomed. I'm developer here in Seattle. I'm Krista Wood, an architect with Perkins Mill. 
I'm Ryan Bussard, architect with Park as well. And Jason Henry, landscape architect with Burger Branch. And we have a number of people in the room as well. It's so nice to see everybody in the full room. It's still our first. It's been a while. Tony Giulio, also with uh, our nation. Isaac Harrison, um, attorney with the Paul Katie Kendall, attorney with the Paul Beverly Barnett, Seattle Department of Transportation. Jeanette Dubois, Seattle Department of Transportation. Uh, Daryl Papalong, designer with Burger and Will. I'm Jordan Slavikov with Burger Partnership and SP Partner. I think that's it. Um, who's going to kick us off? I'm going to kick us off. I apologize uh, for some reason that lighting isn't getting picked up by my <coughs> iPad here. I'm Jack McCullough, and okay, I just, I'm so excited to be here. I just have to say, completely <laughs> thrilled. You know, for most of my career, I've been a frequent flyer here at the commission, and I've scored no points in my account the last three years. So, <laughs> so we're back. Um, and, uh, but we've been busy for these three years because uh, we're actually, this is the first of a few vacations we're going to tee up. <clears throat> um, uh, just a couple thoughts. One is, um, for those of you that we haven't worked with before, we're very careful about how we sort of think about and curate these applications before they come to you. Um, and, and, you know, we end up killing off a bunch of vacation ideas before they ever reach the light of day because they don't make any sense. And so I think over the years we've taken pride in the fact that the ones that we have brought to you are ones that make sense and ones that we've been successful at um, because they did. Right? And, and I think this, in our mind, clearly falls in that category. Um, we've got a full block site you'll see near the Seattle Center. Um, uh, we're going to be taking pains to maintain and restore the alley grid. So there will be no loss there, but uh, there's an important issue with the Thomas Street Green Street to the north of this site. And when we first looked at the site, as you will see, um, I mean, we've all been working on Thomas Street in various aspects, right, over the last several years since Sally Bagshaw got, you know, super focused on it. And, um, and we looked at a no vacation alternative and said, you know, what that's going to do is not going to be good for Thomas Street. Because you're going to have all sorts of vehicular and truck traffic that's going to be coming out of the alley that's going to be basically pointed there. And so that was really um, where we started in looking at this, is trying to come up with a solution that we thought was better, that worked for the site, that was better for the site, but actually was better for the neighborhood. And you can see that today. So, Ryan, you're going to kick us off. I'm going to kick us off. I'm going to share the screen. Yes. <clears throat> Well, it will see that. Yeah. I can see it. We can see it. It's um, commissioners. Can you see the presentation? Yes. It is a, a vagary it's, of this room. Sometimes it takes a little right. bit of delay. Um, it will. Mm -hmm. It's just that there's so much data, and with our Wi-Fi, it takes a little bit of extra time. But that's the beauty of having a Wi-Fi. It's the take delay. I don't think I can advance. But Chris, Chris, Chris. Chris. Hey, great. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to go through the design, kind of where we are right now. Um, so, we've broken this up into a number of different components. Error return. Um, so, we're going to be going through the development goals of the project. Uh, we'll introduce the site, kind of its location. Talk about its context, then actually get into the actual proposed project itself. Uh, talk about uh, a number of different goals that we have for the project, uh, in particular on the development around the objectives proposal and process. And a little bit where we are in the process. Slide. So there are a number of things that, as we started looking at the project, that we really thought carefully about. One was how the project was going to be integrated into the neighborhood. It's a pretty interesting site. It's kind of this uh, juncture between South Lake Union, the uptown neighborhood, Seattle Center, and the downtown core. And it's a kind of remnant you'll see of a nine square grid uh, that's been bisected by a number of arterials, IUI, even the development of the World's Fair site. Uh, we'll talk through those historic references, which are informing the architecture as well as the, the landscape proposal we've prepared. We'll really go through how we're emphasizing the public and pedestrian well within the project. And also how we think a number of the design moves we're making are going to increase site functionality, 
which include Green Street Connections as well as Connection to the Larger Urban Path. Uh, so our proposal is, uh, this is a site <laughs> on the ground floor of it. Uh, we're proposing two high-rise buildings focused on life science tenants within this area. It's a, you know, continuing to be kind of an emergent focus of this area. Uh, we're looking at eight and nine stories, so uh, tall for the neighborhood, but contextual with, with the surrounding neighbors. Uh, and not as tall, obviously, as the downtown pole we're directly adjacent to, or even South Lake Union. Uh, we'll go through the alley vacation. Uh, we're really thinking of this as a new pedestrian connector that bisects the two proposals right north south, two buildings. And talk about the new space we're building into this as well as the new pedestrian connections that feed into that side. Uh, this is where we are in the sign at this point. Uh, we've gone through a number of kind of, uh, kind of building the meetings to kind of build up the story to make consensus around the project, including uh, our kick off back in September. Uh, we have gone through our EBG process uh, and passed that in April of this year. Uh, and we're with you right now. Uh, we are going to be looking at a uh, number of different elements of the project, but uh, this is kind of the snapshot where we are. Finished. Slide. Uh, we've also been doing uh, increased uh, outreach both to agencies uh, within this as well as to the public at, at large. So we've had a number of different components we've incorporated into this design, which was feedback from SPU. Uh, as well as continued coordination with SDCI, Seattle Citywide, SPU, and SSOT on the project. Uh, and then we've also received, in particular, some specific comments around the alley vacation from SSOT in terms of urban forestry and SPU. All those we've been incorporating either now in the project or we will as we continue with the project. Uh, in particular, some of the ones that have come upon us have been from SPU for the solid waste as part of the factor, you know actually vacating the alley, how do we increase the functionality around that? Uh, we've uh, picked up their comments and incorporated into the design so that the functionality that's embedded in the alley is not going to be lost when we remove the alley from the project. Proposing to remove the alley from the project. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, we've also, as part of this process of working with you all and working with the city and different agencies, we've also continued to reach out to the community and get community feedback. Uh, we've done that through a variety of different methods, electronic and digital, printed, project hotline, had virtual open house meetings as well as for community conversations as you can see here with the South Lake Union groups. So we're continuing to have that out, outreach to the to our neighbors as a community at large and incorporating their feedback within the project. Uh, so we want to kind of go through the site and kind of locate the site for you and establish a kind of pattern that we see within the site. So, um, that would be the aerials and kind of the existing conditions within the areas we look at. Uh, this is an aerial view looking from the northeast to the southwest. You can see uh, Seattle Center in the distance, the Space Needle. Um, of the northern boundary of the project is Tom Street, 6th Avenue and Taylor Avenue are bounding edges on the east and west, respectively. And then we have John Street to the south. And you can see this kind of, we're at the center of that kind of nine block grid. Next slide. Um, our site is a really interesting site in terms of not just the urban pattern, but also the topography of the site. We have a fairly um, dramatic, although compared to this area of downtown, not as dramatic, but you know, sloping site uh, with almost 13 feet of grade drop from the southwest corner towards the northeast corner, so 13 feet across. And then it gives you some idea that this is you know one of the larger blocks at 232 feet by 360 and shows the alley vacation area, which is around 5,700 square feet. So there are a number of uses uh, on the site. There were no residential on the site, no housing on the site, uh, and all the structures were either hotels or kind of office buildings. A lot of them react related to the, some of the functionality around Seattle Center. So, uh, give you a glimpse of the urban design context. As I mentioned, we found this area to be really interesting. Uh, you can see here it's an area bound by a number of different uses. Um, it's also interesting in terms of the zoning. You can see what we are SNEP 160M, uh, and we are right at the center of the block here. Next slide. And tell me if I'm going too fast. Um, within this, 
There are a number of really interesting uses around us. We have Seattle Center directly to the west. And you can really see that kind of nine square rib where we're, we really see ourselves as kind of the centerpiece of the neighborhood. Directly to the north is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I've lost video. I mean, sorry, audio. I've also lost audio. Oh, oh. Me too. And the the video is there. I can see the video, but I can't hear anything. I can't hear Ryan. Maybe um, we were on you, I think, at one point. Um. I think it might have something to do with the um, boards and commissions room being on mute. It happened right about the same time the video went off of the boards and commissions room. Now, okay. can you hear now? Yes. Okay. That's very odd. Yes. When did we Ryan, can you can you go back to when you started talking about your vicinity map with um no the no, next slide. Go back one more. No, no next no, this, slide. Is, this is right. The vicinity map connections is when yeah. we lost. Yeah. Oh yeah, here we go. Ryan, Ryan, you said you were the, you said you were you saw yourselves at the center of the neighborhood. Bill and Melinda Gates to the north, and then we kind of lost you. Okay, okay great. That's, that's better than saying after slide one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Jack's been very unusually quiet. <laughs> okay, I'll get out, I'll get re restart for this slide. So, so as we mentioned, you can see our site in blue. It's at the center of this nice work grid. We're bound by Seattle Center to the west, uh, separated by one block. But essentially, that's our kind of largest neighbor with the Institution of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to the north and Denny Park to the southeast of us. So a lot of things you'll see, we're trying to think about those connections, connections to our site, and really using that kind of alley as a way to move people through the site north to the south. Uh, you can also see the pattern of the blocks, which we'll see a little bit more in our figure graph, how that's been established. We have the major Green Street existing along Tom Street, which is our northern border. And right where it says the Seattle Center Skate Park, uh, directly on that lettering is actually a substation, uh, which does not have the alley pattern heading through that. And then we have a number of really uh, great connectivity mm -hmm. in terms of bus stops, even the monorail. So a lot of mass transit opportunities mm -hmm. and, and a lot of energy uses directly around our site. Uh, in terms of thinking about the project, we, we really have thought it does exist in this kind of hybrid of two worlds. The neighborhood exists between kind of spectrum of development, even the type of tenants our client is looking at uh, south of Union to our east, as well as thinking about the kind of pavilions, the history, the character of Seattle Center directly in our west. So we thought it's a way to kind of fuse that in terms of how we make place, think about the connections of the neighborhood as well as the architecture. Uh, this is a little bit more detail around this, so you can see there's a real variety of uses directly around this from residential, commercial, retail, office, hospitality, a really kind of mixed use neighborhood, uh, as well as, you know, once again, these connections uh, across the site uh, that you can start to see in terms of the figure ground. Uh, this is a 3D view or aerial view now looking from the southeast to the northwest. You can see the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation directly to the north, and then Seattle Center at the top of the page. And as well as Thomas Street is the way it actually crosses and starts to become that major east-west connector. We've also uh, looked at this, uh, and it looks like our building slid uh, off the site. <laughs> we will be building our project within the property line. <laughs> 
great public benefit. <laughs> exactly. yeah. We have that's uh, it's, it's interesting. Anyways, the uh, major bus routes exist one block away from us on the east, west, and south sides, as well as the monorail. So great connectivity directly around our site. Uh, as well as um, we have uh, the protected kind of bike lanes and future bike lanes, which are directly occurring north of our site along Thomas Street, as well as, you know, one of the things we thought through is then bringing that functionality for bike racks so that can help bikes move through the site to our site. And like, likewise, um, we're surrounded by essentially class three pedestrian streets, uh, with the exception of being Thomas Street directly to the Uh, the alleys uh, within this pattern exist uh, directly to around the site, but as I mentioned before, uh, with the substation directly above us on Thomas Street, the alleys do not extend through. So between that use being precluded directly north of the site and also trying to really not provide another vehicular entry or exit onto the Green Street, we think there's a lot of stopping this structure. Uh, in terms of the way traffic works around the site, uh, we have essentially two-way traffic surrounding us. Uh, we've been thinking then about this idea. You can see the buildings uh, have been shifted to create open space on the northwest corner and the southeast corners of the site. Um, part of the idea of that Maybe is that Brian, we can, if you pause for just a minute, yeah. I'll open the, a better version. Can we share that? Yeah. You'd have to take it. Yeah. We, we will build up. <laughs> It'd be nice to have a diagram match it. You really shifted the grid. We, yeah, yeah. We, we imagine the public benefit discussion will be quite robust. <laughs> yeah. The John yeah. Street is not really yeah. 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 No? no? Okay, well, it's our opening shot. Okay. Um, so you can see you're now correctly placed within the block. <laughs> the, uh, you know, part of this idea of shifting the mass is to Great, kind of these really generous kind of open spaces that met diagonally through the site, uh, and that work well with both drop off, but also thinking about how people arrive. And you can see the kind of green triangle. Part of this benefit is also when thinking to the project is that we're trying to think of one concise loading and vehicular entry at the south side of the site. So really trying to reduce the amount of vehicles moving through the site or moving around it that would service the building. We've done a lot of analysis on the uh, actual traffic counts and the pedestrian counts, you know, for this area. I think the, what the numbers are telling us is a pretty uh, low intensity use surrounding the area with the majority of the traffic actually along 6th Avenue. I think that's part of the character is everyone's moving from the site to the edges of this uh, to reach to Denny or, or to 7th Avenue or even over to 5th Avenue. So not much traffic actually inside of Ripping or moving out. And likewise, on the pedestrian numbers, the, the most interesting aspect, I think, for this is um, people are moving through the site to reach other destinations, particularly to move to Seattle Center. And what we found is some of the highest numbers were actually occurring at our alley, where people are using it as a connector, which I think makes sense when you think of moving diagonally from the, from the South Lake Union or Denny Park or from the downtown core to reach the gateway of Seattle Center which is on Thomas Street, one of the major entry points. And also, if you think about that 13 feet of um, gray change diagonally across the valley, it was one of the more gentle ways to move across that site, more accessible. Did you repeat that first part of that? You said you were doing pedestrian counts, or you observed? We did the pedestrian counts, yeah. yes, to validate that. Yes, to exist. yes. what's existing on the sure. site. So we'll kind of go through the proposed projects. We'll give an overview of what we're proposing. So we've really thought about this, and this is from our original kind of EDG submission, kind of as two, two ways to think through the project. One was with no alley vacation, uh, which is the scheme on the left. Uh, and then our proposal, which is with the alley vacated. Couple things that you'll see is we're actually proposing less density on the site. Uh, we're also looking at the stories being similar, uh, eight and nine stories for the proposal, eight stories for the other. So we're trying to compact the mass on the site, add an extra floor to account for that, but we'll propose less density. We think that it makes a lot of sense because by carving out the site, we can actually open up so we can prioritize help pedestrians and people are going to be using the space and having it. Uh, we have a singular kind of shared access, as I was pointing before, for below grade access, both loading and vehicular access. 
And it allows us to really open up the site, wide open space, not just to meet the prescriptive requirement of the zoning, but actually exceed it and have it be meaningful in space. So here are the two site plans. Uh, the version on the left is with no alley vacation. There's some unusual aspects about the zoning in this area, which would actually require us to make four independent structures. That's why you see four loading docks. And to achieve the density that would require, as I mentioned, not just four cords, but four loading docks on that alleyway. So supercharging the kind of heavier uses of that space. You can see that with the four kind of yellow uh, kind of triangles at the entry points to those loading areas, as well as really make that a uh, heavy use conduit of that alley through John Street and outletting on Thomas. Um, the proposal we have on the right is to really think of inverting that, really opening up the space. You can see how we've started to carve out the ground plate. So opening up the corners of the site, thinking about the alley now being about pedestrians, being about celebrating that connectivity to Seattle Center, uh, and also focusing the passenger service via Marcher to one location off John Street and removed from that kind of public space and green space. So you're backing the stretch up the alley in the no alley vacation? In the no alley, I actually think they would pass through that probably from Jones Street, turn into that, and then exit onto Thomas with the event. Like turning right this kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, for the no alley vacation, service alley remains. We do have the increased potential for emerging and vehicular pedestrian because as the kind of numbers we're showing, people do and already have been passing through the middle of the site. Uh, it obviously disrupts the Thomas Green Street, but we've been trying to really rethink how the space is not only that connection between the buildings or the alleys, but it then connects to new green space we've created at the southeast and northwest corners of this. So really opportunities to enhance that connection. We also have some larger right-of-ways around the site, so we're not going to forget about the edges of the site, how we get that into the, the character of that, and Jason in particular will talk through that in more detail. So as Ryan mentioned, I think the heart of the concept and proposal is that we're removing vehicles from the middle and floor of the site and creating a space for pedestrians. Uh, you know, the carving back or peeling back of the corners of the building, I think was key. Some of the feedback that we heard from EDG, uh, trying to have a connection, uh, both visual and physical through there, I think to accentuate that desire line is definitely a goal. Okay, so in terms of the creation of the type of space that we're envisioning, uh, a couple of key things that we were looking at was, you know, opening to the sky, uh, but suggesting of overhead lighting and kind of a rich ground plane, both in terms of lush plantings, uh, but also the materiality of the ground plane itself. We also work really hard to make sure that there, uh, it feels connected in terms of the elevation of this relative to the buildings. Uh, the actual portals and corners uh, help serve, you know, to define that, that route through the space. And another important piece too was the study on how to locate the plazas and how the building mass informed those. Uh, we did a lot of studies, as Jack said, you know, there's a lot of work to get to this point. Uh, so it was studying like, does it make more sense on the Thomas Street side where we have the green screen? Does it make more sense on the south side where we have better solar exposure? Where we ended up was sort of two distinct plazas that take benefit from both those solar exposures. They also help accentuate that movement from Denny Park to Seattle Center. So we do get really diverse kind of types of spaces too. So people can hang out, people can, you know, have a chance to pause dependent upon the weather, having a variety of material types, a lot of different seating options, I think, are all part of the program. As Ryan said, we've got a really good ample sort of pedestrian realm, both on the street frontages and even the building activation and where the drop-off zones, I think, help activate the space. Just a quick diagram showing that important connection, and this is really what struck the design team as we started looking at the project and as we began to describe it. That connection to open space and how it relates to the neighborhood, I think, is extremely important. The other kind of key design tenet is the accessibility of the building to the, not only the public realm, but having these big open spaces too. And there is actually a fair bit of grade change over the course of the site. There's about 10 feet north to south. So really we're trying to make that 
uh, fluid. So you can move from the pedestrian realm in and out of these spaces, uh, as well as through the pedestrian, pedestrian connection through the middle part of the site without having the abrupt grade changes. And making it fully accessible was one of the, the early design goals and we worked really hard to maintain that as we develop the design. So this is just a quick diagram showing kind of the bike activation and where we got the drop-offs. We've got bike racks planned throughout the site, but at the main building entries will also uh, have those drop-off uh, loading zones. And we're also looking at, you know, what sort of amenities that we can provide in the pedestrian realm, uh, as well as through the pedestrian connection, and what type of activation we can create by having this uh, bike storage there in the middle. So as we mentioned, you can see uh, just in the proportion between the two plans, the amount of surface that would be required uh, for the no alley vacation on the left, uh, as well as the amount of loading on that zone versus we're really trying to limit and think about the, the kind of public realm activating those edges, the amount of transparency we can provide. So by um, having that just be all the vehicles a little below grade, the only bit of opaque surface uh, is for that service you can see on the right, which is that basically the speed limit to take us down. Um, one of the other things that are there are uh, existing site utilities going through the alley uh, right now through that north-south connector. So we've been shifting those and moving those uh, to our perimeter. Uh, I think one of the benefits of having a very generous kind of right away around us is that we can route those kind of electrical and telecom lines around this and still have generous areas for the plantings, for trees, and other things around the site. So uh, we don't have to prioritize one over the other. We also have um, been able to really think about not just adding open space to this, but adding meaningful open space to the project. So you can see that we have uh, fairly prescriptive open space on the No Alley Vacation line along Thomas Street, along the Green Street on the proposal on the left. Uh, but on the version on the right, and as, as Jason was showing you, know, we really started to think about shifting those to anchor each corner of the site for that diagonal connection which allows us to uh, not only meet the open space requirement, but exceed it in, in the areas that we think would be highly beneficial to their experience. The other point on that too, I mentioned the building angling, I think is another key thing to subtly the impacts against the fall since we were in the Yes. Um, this is one of our favorite slides, followed up by one of our other favorite slides, <laughs> the elevation of the alleyway. Um, and how, you know, once you prioritize the loading, how that starts to take over, which is really uh, seen clearly in the view from the upper right uh, of that loading area where the alley essentially becomes a service zone. Uh, the contrast is what we're proposing, that that's part of the public realm that's experienced, you know, some of the elevations here shown. We brought in this idea of the arches and the concept of that, so not just provide diagonal cuts through and under the building to recall the architecture of Seattle Center, the kind of mid-century pavilions, the kind of playfulness uh, those had. And that allows us to also push the glass line under those arches to have a big enough program along those edges uh, to activate those spaces. And then just a few images as we wrap up that are really showing a little bit about the the open space with the architecture. Uh, Jason and I are not only sitting together, but we've worked closely together on the project and with the whole team to really think about designing this comprehensively, starting with the kind of urban framework of the project and thinking about how architecture and landscape can create a meaningful space from the new plaza on the southeast corner, which is framed by the architecture, which we think is a really beautiful, you know, it's not rendered here, it's a sunny spot uh, for the community and for the people within the area. That's the gateway to that new pedestrian connector, which is shown on the upper right. And then it outlets on this new plaza space, which is really seen as kind of the connector to Thomas Street to energize that space, but also now where you can see both South Lake Union to the east, as well as see the new gateway, or the gateway to Seattle Center to the west. Uh, we've also uh, been doing chase shadow analysis. So, uh, you know, one of the benefits of a north-south connector is we know throughout the year we'll be able to drive some daylight into that space. Uh, but really, you know, thinking about the character as we work through the character of those open spaces, they should feel different. They'll have different types of plantings. Southeast quarter wants to really harvest the sun. We can get a lot of daylight throughout the year in that. The northwest is going to be a more shady in that area. 
So these last three slides are <clears throat> about a little bit about planning ecology and again reiterating that we wanted to create a sense uh, in that urban connection so that it wasn't seem like this is all over structure, which it is. Uh, so we've got sort of different ecological zones from the south, the pedestrian connection through between the buildings, which is a little bit shadier, but I do think that it'll be sort of dappled light, and that actually works really well with our Pacific Northwest native forest. I think that the south plaza this is is a little bit more meta like It's a chance to introduce some native perennials and grasses, so it should be uh, exciting. The this is almost like uh, old growth forest floor. Uh, a lot of ferns, a lot of other things that we can make it rich and textural. Uh, and again, that relationship between the planting and the elevation of the paving is really important. So working that we don't have these raised planters, we don't feel claustrophobic in this space uh, is key. too fast. And then these, I'm actually really excited about having these spaces and these little pockets of plant material and these little treasures, you know, check out the little frill area if anybody you knows, knows plants. Um, is this really cool native plant that we never see? It's going to be something that we only get out in some lawns. So having these little moments of surprise and discovery, I think, as we pass through this space, uh, are really compelling. So I wanted to, to outline kind of the have to address them and the benefits that we see with this. So in many ways, we think, you know, this is going to enhance kind of three key attribution of access and circulation through the site. Really think about maximizing that circulation, really think in a friendly space that would be to increase the connectivity of this area of the city. Uh, we do think the open space is going to be really transformative in this area. We're transforming a service alley, which is already used into a place for people and plants, nature. Um, it'll be enhancing the sense of place that's established there. In fact, the idea that we're in the middle of the nine square bricks and we feel a responsibility to really be the anchor for the neighborhood in many ways. And that it's going to open up light and view, not only for the people working in the buildings, but also for people moving around it. And then uh, some ideas about the public benefits then. So uh, once again, from this graphic, uh, what we're thinking of this idea of the open space on the northwest, so north is to the left. Well, on Thomas Street, it's really going to enhance the Green Street, it really act as an energizer for that area. Uh, we're enhancing placemaking, not only through this space, we spent a lot of time thinking about the vacation alley, that's like the sweet industrial connector. We're thinking all the edges of the site, so placemaking around the perimeter of the block as well. Uh, we're also thinking, you know, through we would be increasing the right of way improvements around the class three pedestrian streets that surround our neighborhood, uh, as well as, you know, not only just six Avenue, but John and Taylor. And then lastly, that we think this this new kind of pedestrian connector is going to be a really special place uh, that enhances the current path that exists in the area. Yeah. That's where we are. Right. Ryan, I'd just like to close with one thought. I always ask the question after. Public benefits. What are the private benefits? Because that's often, you know, the, the subtext, yes, the unstated yeah. issue here. Yes. And sometimes you're very. Lost audio again. Can you all still hear us? Now we can. Uh, you, ju you just came back just when you said that. We didn't hear you before. Hi. Yeah, I think the Michael, I did not book the rest of the room for the day, so we just got locked. <laughs> okay, partially, but he's, he's uh, complicated. <laughs> Thank you.
So it might just be a second as we uh, figure that out. Did you, where did Jack, you? Jack, could you repeat what you were saying? That's when the audio um, the, broke off. Uh, yeah. the, you just started with a discussion of what is the private benefit and we heard a sentence or two and then that's it. Right. It's sort of an unstated Sometimes it's obvious that the private space. None of that is the case here. I think the one. Alien invasion. Yeah. I just unmuted, but yes, I got that loud and clear. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah. I'm going to try this one more time. Yeah. Great. No. <laughs> Welcome, Jim. Thank you very much. Is this amazing? Uh, you this is amazing. So we're talking about private benefits. And the only, I think, private benefit, frankly, here is um, there's this vacation allows the connection of the subgrade garage. So we create some efficiency of the subgrade garage, basically. But that efficiency, I would suggest, is probably at the end of the day more than offset by the fact that by putting all the loading down on P1, you have to substantially overbuild P1 and you've got to go deeper in the ground in order to create enough clear height, you know, to get the loading down there. So, you know, it's it's kind of a push, I think, from that point of view. And I just say this honestly, we looked at this and this just seemed like a better solution for the site. And uh, figuring the building's gonna be here for a hundred years, let's do the right thing. So that's it. Um, thank you. Benita, um, while we have a packed house, I think there are two people on the call. We have two people attending the meeting on the call. Um, I do want to reserve just a couple of minutes for Beverly to kind of explain SDOT's role. Uh, for the people who are attending online, um, if you can raise your hand, if you wanted to make up to two minutes of public comment, we'll come back and check with you. Um, just some high level comments from you, Beverly, to help the commission. Yeah, I don't think they can probably see me, so it's very nice. You have a place of honor. I, I haven't been here in so long because I've all these people, yeah. and, and Michael said we could not wear bun slippers. So <laughs> I didn't quite sure if we are. So, um, it, it is kind of weird to be here. Uh, thank you. Um, um, Jackson is here also, if he's still on, so we may want to get actual words from him instead of my quoting him. But um, thank you. Um, I do think sometimes when we look at sort of the first part of an alley vacation, the, the vacation itself and the public trust impacts, that we can be a little more kind of prosaic about that. It's like, oh, you know, it's the alley function and they're putting it in the building. But it really does guide every other step in the process in terms of what happens around the site and how the buildings are oriented and how it relates to the larger community. So I'm glad that you guys at the Design Commission take such care in step one because it is a step that leads and links everything else. So I think with this, um, and, and um, I, I hopefully Jackson will speak to this as well, this is kind of one of those blocks that there's not really any good or perfect way to get in and out. Um, and you know, as you guys know, in looking at all these urban projects, when we have green streets and bike lanes and bus routes, and I don't know, are we gonna get some sound transit stations at some point, um, it can be very difficult. And now we see the um, utilities really increasing. Um, I, I know one of the early issues with this was the scale needed of access for um, Seattle public utilities vehicles, which exponentially grow. So the, the complications of dealing with utilities and access and the impacts on the um, streetscape are really, really important. I think um, we did flag some early issues with SPU and others that um, are resolvable and close to resolved if not done, um, but it still does leave the question of, uh, you know, how much do we want to 
mimic the existence of the alley and how much do we want it to evaporate and look at a different streetscape? And I think that's the question I know you guys always grapple with. But um, I, I think um, there's nothing in the alley that's irreplaceable and cannot be accommodated. So from the first step, I think it's more kind of the design and public benefit, public realm connections. And I think now that we're really looking at elevating the land use discussion with the alley vacation discussion, looking at um, how this project should relate to the Seattle Center as opposed to the old north-south orientation. Those are all kinds of things um, for us to discuss. But um, I, I think that's it for me, because um, I thought since Jackson's here, you can get actual stuff from him. Jackson, did you have any? Thank you, Beverly. Thank you. Jackson, were there any kind of high level comments you wanted to make before we ask commissioners, we turn it to commissioner for questions? Thanks, Michael. And I apologize, my, my webcam is not working. Um, so I am Jackson Cook, S. Street Use. I am the Street Use Development Review uh, planner assigned to um, Beverly's review of the vacation. Um, I, I don't have a, a lot of high level comments. I can say that um, in general, we have. Uh, done some coordination with um, Urban Forestry and uh, the traffic operations folks um, on this request. And I think our thinking is roughly in line with um, uh, the point that was made at the beginning of the presentation um, that we do see some benefit to moving vehicles off of Thomas Street and, and onto a single access point from John, um, which is one of the one of the goals of the vacation. Um, so I think from a, from a street operations perspective, we are um, conceptually supportive of the vacation right now. Um, the applicant team was very gracious in um, getting us a lot of a lot of last minute uh, documentation for um, showing how the below grade access is going to work. So we really appreciate that. And um, most of those comments have been resolved. Um, we will continue to work with SDCI to review. Um, uh, turning movements in more detail if we if and when we advance to a mob stage um, but in general I think um, our concern was that it'd be possible to provide all um, vehicle service like solid waste and, and freight uh, service in the below grade uh, facilities and we are generally conceptually on the page that uh, looks like we're heading in that direction um, so we don't have any big concerns right now thank you Jackson uh, Benita, should we start in the room and go to um, virtual and then when we go to deliberation, go to virtual and then in the room just to mix it up? Sounds good. Um, maybe if, because uh, it's hard to know, a little hard for me to tell being online who's in the room and who's not. So maybe somebody could just call out the order as we go through. I think we'll start uh, right to left or left to right, right to left. Uh, Elizabeth, Adam, Jill, and then Amalia. So why don't we start with Elizabeth? Thank you for all the details and um, and presence <laughs> in the room. Um, I I have uh, had some questions about um, how uh, what usually happens in the alley and added. Uh, adding what Beverly just mentioned about SPU um, activities. How uh, you see those interacting with um, whatever is going on on John? Because it sounds like everything is being moved to that location. So I'm wondering what the, if I'm not a person on the Green Street, but I'm on John, what's, what would that mean to me? Sure. I think this might be <clears throat> helpful to kind of see this. So um, right now, you know, the, the functionality of the alley from a servicing point of view, which would be all of our kind of waste collection all of our loading for the building, all of that would occur uh, as the diagram showed on the left. The, the issue around from a John Street perspective is I think the majority of those trucks would still be accessing uh, and probably with our orientation of the loading dock the way it worked out, would probably be facilitated a north connection from John Street. So my sense would be the amount of trucks entering the south from the south side would be the same whether is the version we're proposing or the version if you have the alley in place. 
I think the difference is um, we're providing, by having that off the John Street, we're stopping that connection going through to Thomas. And we're also focusing that, um, the John Street, so it's a single curb cut on, the John, on our proposal. And it also has fairly generous green space on either end. So it's a safe crossing for that use. So it, does that help to answer? Yeah, and, and yeah. what activities would happen subterranean then? What activities? What activities would happen? Yeah, so all servicing for the buildings, all vehicular, all the parking for the buildings. So okay. essentially all the service related or the loading functions are all below grade. So trash and things like trash, that. Trash, every, everything is below grade. Right. So I would add to it too. It's going to take all that noise that's generated from the loading yard right. and put it inside the building where it's now going to yeah. be contained inside the building. Where if it's in the alley, right, it's got that ability to escape to the neighborhood, right. So by focusing it inside the building, really kind of helps control all that internal screen. I, I think the other difference which we're doing in the positive is that you also see a lot of bikers push down to the loading areas, the garage areas in these buildings, which creates conflict around speed ramps and other things. It's a factor that's left never comfortable to do. Mm -hmm. um, we've actually said, you know, we think that area should go. We're looking at that as all the kind of new pedestrian connector space at grade. So it gives better visibility as well as increased functionality. And just trying to really think about ways to rethink how people commute. So we're trying to move people spaces up and the service spaces that don't need to revolt. Really. John's also the most challenging in terms of utilities and tree complex and everything else going on too. So having that single entrance and not compromising the tree or we can do trees and other planting and other amenities, it was actually I think happy to see this as one that rose to the top. Um, a related question. You do have pedestrian counts through the existing we do, yes. Who are these people? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so they were pedestrian counts done when the previous kind of existing buildings were still there. Um, and there was a service or surface parking lot there as well, in addition to um, kind of hotel, motel, and a, and a few um, kind of commercial business activity. So um, the pedestrian counts that we saw were, were tied to those existing functions, is what kind of our initial assessment was. Um, okay. And we did see overall, kind of throughout the day, the highest level of activity was, um, or I guess throughout the day, the most activity was actually through that alley space instead of around the edges of the building, which kind of lead us to that park, people who are parking on the site conclusion. Um, so we're continuing to study that and work through it with our, our traffic impact analysis and our additional consultants. And I think it's probably a sign also that we have to also think about kind of healing the edges, the boundaries of the block as well, make it friendlier, having uses. So like bike racks on those edges, seating areas. So the public realm enhancements, not just around the outer, but the edges. So um, I, I think, as, I'm wondering as you continue to study those statistics, basically, are you, I'm, I'm assuming you have a public involvement in place coming up what's happening what's happening with that good slide on that yep really good. yeah so we've completed our, our public outreach um, through both uh, kind of uh, mailings to the to the community um, we had a couple of public oh, yeah, yep public meetings um, and we've also reached out to other you know, organization, interest organizations in the area. Um, the, and I'm gonna say this from Uptown Alliance um, provided some great feedback as well, and we'll continue to keep them in the loop as the design progresses. Okay. But I will add, Commissioner, we've learned anything from our time in front of the commission is that public outreach never stops. And we will expect you will ask that same question <laughs> at the next meeting. What have you done since the last one? Yeah, so I mean, we're on. Yeah. We're on. So I guess um, uh, uh, also related to action, you, you talked about being the center of the neighborhood. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, it's, it, that being very important for this particular project. Um, how would you, right now, I realize you're continuing public involvement. And, in studies, how would you characterize the neighborhood? In terms of, well, I think um, 
you know, a couple of things that we've shown the analysis. I think it's a it's a neighborhood that's evolving quite a bit in terms of you know, think about the new buildings that are coming online. It's primarily residential, kind of on the edges of the site. And then the, the uses are almost, or the building blocks are almost migrating to the north and the east, where as you get closer south, like you see more uses like that, more lab or office buildings or other uses. It's also a neighborhood that's unusual in terms of, it has, it has a little bit of everything. So it has, has the residential and commercial office, the research, but it also has infrastructure. So the, the tunnel service buildings are on the site. We have public spaces, such as the skate park directly to our northwest. And the connections, we could argue the Green Street is a public Green Street connector, green connector. Um, we also have uh, other infrastructure with the substation directly north, and we have institutional projects. Uh, so as this was showing, it's it's not a homogeneous neighborhood in terms of uses. It's quite diverse in terms of uses. And, and I think the only thing that is maybe consistent is that most of the development of the, the architecture is fairly recent for this, with the exception of some of the substations. So it's kind of an interesting neighborhood. So I think as we go through the DRB process, you know, thinking about the architecture and the landscape as being a way to build off, I think, our design guidelines and success of what's the building blocks in terms of the entire community. The other part of that too, I think, in terms of what we see is green and the reason that yes. the diagram is super important between Denny Park and Seattle Center and big civic spaces, there are not a lot of trees. There's no. not a lot of respite, not a lot of refuge. Yes. Um, in this site in particular, but yes. in the core of that neighborhood. Yes. And I have one, one additional question. Um, I, I tend to try and imagine myself in spaces yeah. like what, what would I see and feel while I'm drawing. Uh, walking through the, the, the diagonal space you're proposing, um, how, how, what are the uses adjacent to that space that I'm walking through? How, how would I experience those uses? Yeah. What's who, who's who's there? Can I can I see inside the building? Yes. Can yeah. I can I walk into the building? Yeah, it's probably it's more the uses that integral to the building at that point. There's a lot of activity for you know, kind of amenity spaces for the people in the building at those edges. Um, so we have kind of a conferencing center down at the lower level. I agree, kind of the park spaces, the undercut. We're really thinking, as you can see, as we'll see in a second. <laughs> The, the, the spaces, um, the, the base of the building feels porous, and that we're using these large art, architectural arches to frame those spaces. So we will have kind of at that southeast corner of the building, off the plaza space, kind of, a, kind of event conferencing area. As you move up, you'll see the kind of commuter kind of bike area, which is glazed, so you can see the people using the space, um, which includes like a small mechanic area. So really having such a sort of bike, but also activity within that. Across from that will be the fitness center uh, area, so there will be people exercising throughout the day. And then as you move up, we'll have the kind of lobby spaces directly seen from that area. So we're trying to range almost thinking from morning to evening, variety of uses. And also, we're thinking of this pedestrian space as being like highly active throughout the day. We're trying to think of spaces that, you know, in our winter time where it's dark out, right? They're lit up, they're kind of glowing, there's activity uses. Uh, as well as, you know, thinking about it feeling both fairly welcoming for that. So not really formal uses at that lower level, people moving through the space, active uses. And I mean, how many of those uses would I be able, as a person just casually walking through, um, can, I, can I walk in and use the fitness center? What's the um, right now they're dedicated, we're thinking they're dedicated to the use of the building, but we're thinking that the space, the exterior space is welcoming. We want people to feel welcome and move through it, and that's also why Look on this, that's really interesting, so it's showing up on the screen. That bottom view on the right, we spent a lot of time with the, the design board to talk about these visual connections through the building, under the building, through the building, these, that, this kind of, we, we drew kind of a magic line. Well, I guess it's not magic, it was a line. But, uh, through the building, connecting the open spaces with the idea that as you move through it, people feel welcoming and, and kind of welcomed into the space if they could see through it. And see that that so we spent a lot of time really trying to open the apertures of that undercutting the building so that as you move through it, you see a destination to move through, uh, and that it feels safe and welcome as you go through. So if I walk through there at night, I'll I'll feel safe and welcome. Yes, you should. Yes, because it's going to be well lit and there's activities at those locations. And it'll be a space that's maintained by by, by, by the client. Yes. 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 And and what about 
issues, problems that may occur as they occur in public spaces. So we have typically on, on these places, we would have 24 seven security. And so we would have people being able to roam and keeping the space clean and occupied and making sure that, you know, it's always in that safe state, right? And so that's kind of the intent is always to have that, that presence there locally. Thank you. Yes. Matt. Matt. <laughs> I don't know. Sorry. Not, not Matt. Yeah. <laughs> that makes a little bit of um, uh, Thanks to the team. I had uh, a couple of, um, Technical questions um, that I just wanted to kind of quickly run through. Could you flip back to slide 32? I think I can do most of them off of slide 32. Uh, I, I'm, most of my questions are going to be just trying to understand what's um, required by code and um, what you're proposing. Um, so on the on the left there, on the no alley vacation, are you suggesting, or do I understand correctly, is there a required setback off of Thomas Street? It looks really deep, like 60 or 80 feet. Um, on that left hand image. There is a setback, but not to the level of that that we're proposing. We concentrate our open space. Okay. And then what about on um, John Street? Is there a kind of a build to line that you um, that John Street is asking you to get towards? Around the site, um, there's roughly a, a 12 foot maximum allowable setback unless you're creating a dedicated public plaza okay. um, or open space. And so that's what you're seeing reflected in both of these plans, but done in a, in a different way. Um, so we're working the edges of our building that are not set back for public areas are within that kind of zoning requirement to maintain the chief edge. Great. And then you could slide these buildings in the no action. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. And then how about the, uh, it's not on this slide, but you had mentioned um, going from the no alley vacation to the alley vacation, you're, um, Bumping one, building up a story. Is that uh, is that a deviation from zoning, or is that within that allowable zoning? Both, it's within. Yeah, both yeah. of the building heights. Um, we're within a maximum height of actually 125 feet, so we're lower than the 160 um, residential limit allowed in the neighborhood. Um, and that ninth floor is actually being slotted into the building within that same building height, and that's the envelope. Great. Uh, and then. Um, the loading docks, the four independent required loading docks. So uh, the, the consolidation you're doing, is that a deviation from the from the zoning? No. And then uh, I think my final question is, uh, this is, I'm gonna make a comment to the commission. Uh, it took me a minute to figure it out. I think your rendering showed it clearly and your drawings are great, but I just wanted to point out to the commission, I think what we're seeing is that there, you've actually got towers above these piers, right? That you've got a rectilinear tower above the piers. This is a ground floor plan. Right. Within those, uh, I guess, towers or mid rise or whatever, um, are you maintaining the 20 foot separation uh, throughout the block um, or is that? Uh... Yes. Yes. So the on the, the right hand side image, um, that narrowest kind of pinch point between the buildings is our 20 foot um, kind of minimum condition. And then we've worked at level one here to set back and make that a a kind of broader, more welcoming extent as much as possible. So the you have a 30 foot long, 20 foot wide segment. Yes. So rest exceed right. in some areas. At, at the ground. Right. Right. At the ground. Right. 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 Yeah. And that was one of the discussions we had with the design board yeah. about that. Great. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Jill. Thanks. Um, a, a couple of slides on. You got. Um, uh, the, 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 I don't know what to mute or unmute here. Um, you've got uh, your urban context, your urban connection. I have it as 37, but I'm, 37. I'm working off the, it might be a little bit different. Different one I think I have here. Actually, there. Oh, there. Uh, It'll I'll zoom out. I go really slow because I'm, 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 I'm wanting to see the connectivity. Yeah, I mean, it's showing up here. So here, there we go. and I understand that we have a little bit of a problem. Yeah. yeah um, but if I understand correctly, and I think that you've got a good point about the grade, by the way, um, you're advocating that this is a good connection. But this takes me back then to your page 18, which explains that Thomas is. Street and John is a class three pedestrian street. So, do you have more information about the 
quality of that pedestrian experience going to be different from Queen Street to Class 3? And probably the biggest deal is the crossing of 7. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you know what the improvements are proposed for those two different crossings? Or basically, your work, right? Mm -hmm. And which is really going to be the safer, more desirable way to move? Because, you know, just looking at, at Google Earth, I mean, it looks like John's kind of a rough cross. And is there any proposed ever? And even Bruce's is this big reading kind of stuff. So um, I think you do want to put, we'll get into that later. But anyway, I wondered if you knew any, if you had any more information to share with us about that. So that was my only question. I'm going to piggyback on that a little bit. One of your circulation slides showed um, Thomas, well, basically, both Taylor and Six having the two way operations. Um, and I just wanted to hear a little bit more how I know that there's been some changes with Thomas, but I was just wondering how you factored in potential future lack of access or lack of turning movements on Thomas into your uh, site plan for vehicles specifically. And it's tied to, yeah. to Jill's, well, more about just how how people are going to get to the site, right? So, you, so you've so consolidated all of your, your loading and your services. Um, it is, you, you are not able to take a left onto 7th from Thomas. You're not, may in the future not be able to even be on Thomas Mm -hmm. uh, to turn down. So I just, you're starting to limit where vehicles are going to be moving around the block and the loading and unloading. And so I just, could you talk a little bit more about, there's, there was the slide that had the two arrows, it showed the parking, it showed the loading and unloading, and it, it just felt a bit disconnected from plans that we've seen about Thomas, what we know Thomas's priorities are for a green street, and it feels like they're if you could just talk a little bit about your assumptions, because it feels like there was there's a disconnect happening. And so I just want to make sure we're clear on what you're assuming are kind of how people are really going to come to the site in, in a vehicle. Um, and then I have a second question after that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the disconnect is. We were, um, so right now you're showing Thomas as a right. two-way right. traffic direction. Right. Well, Thomas is, that, that, that is not accurate, because okay. Thomas, Thomas does not connect to the former Broad. Right. I mean, that was one of the things Sally did right before she left council. So, um, so I think we've been assuming that there's not, Thomas is not going to be uh, an active part of our access network to the site. Right. And so we're kind of doubling down on that to try to force all that to happen at the south. And I think in general, um, I mean, even if we don't do the vacation, don't do anything here, because the level is, Vehicular levels when Thomas are going to decline by virtue of the fact that Green Street is not connected to the grid. Um, but so we're just trying to reinforce that. It's, it's our effort. Totally understand that. Right. I think where I'm seeing the disconnect is you've got these proposed drop off zones and, and parking and, and, and entry to, gar right. to garages, right? Which, which really define the outside. Right engagement right. and so in your other plan kind of to fall on Joe's mm -hmm. point you had the diagonal line coming through and when I look at the site plan it feels like there is a potential of barriers to actually invite people into the site to make that diagonal movement even if they've been able to get there so you've, you've right now you're showing a south southeast you're showing basically proposed drop-off zone. So you're yeah, right. you're inviting pedestrians and bicyclists right. in, you're asking them to go into your site to drop their bikes off. So yeah. I guess that's the broader context of like, could you talk a little bit how you thought through, activity. well, how does the curbside activity right. impact how people are getting into the site and you're right. asking the bikers to go to the middle, you're asking people to cut through, which, which is great. I'm just, mm -hmm. there seems to be a bit of a disconnect. So I could just talk a little bit about how you've, how you've decided and how you maybe have located various things in relation to this really kind of significant change in circulation. Right. I think it's, yeah, so just a little bit about, you've, you've done a lot of data collection, and so I just want to know how you kind of all brought it together, because it feels a bit disconnected. And it may partly still be a working. Yeah, I think, I, think that, I think that's part of the fairness. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, a couple of things. I mean, as far as you know, where we're connecting pedestrians to, it's going to be from all over the place. So looking at people and what where they want to go, and then where do people you know who are occupying the site want to go? Uh, so I think that a lot of it was uh, knowing that there are Thomas Street plans, and we even implemented projects along Thomas Street as many people have, you know, and knowing that the to Jack's point that there's going to be decreased vehicular traffic. The other thing too, I think that's key. I think some of the other previous plans too, the building entrance is sort of focusing them out for the pedestrian realm to help activate. We heard that there was a little uh, less, uh, you know, trying to create some more um, depth and excitement along the two streets on uh, north, south, both on Six and Taylor too. So that was part of the reason that you see some of these shifts and trying to create these sort of plaza-like spaces that sort of embrace the public realm too. So, you know, it is definitely a work in progress. We're still early in the design process. And, you know, we're coming back to look into some more detail. But I do think that they do serve as, you know, anchors. They are inviting people in, uh, as well as accommodating a variety of uses that are always uh, an interesting challenge for them. And I think we have to take this as some homework. I mean, it's a very good point you make yeah. about how we organize the curbside activities. And I yeah. think we can be more intentional about that, frankly, than mm -hmm. we probably have been. Thanks. Anything else? Um, why don't we start with Matt? Okay. Thanks. Really good presentation, Ryan and team. Just want to thank you for the context and leading us through. I have a couple questions. I'm going to limit these comments to questions, and then uh, one is about the on this slide the the need. I'm just uh, not understanding the need for. What appears to be four cores, not just four loading zones, but four cores rather than two when in the no alley vacation. What's driving that need to have four loading? Oh, I can, Matt, I can take this one. It's a, it's a strange um, sort of piece of the, the zoning was adopted in 2017, the uptown zoning. And um, it, it uh, imposes a maximum building length in the zone, um, but it, um, it allows uh, that maximum building length to be, there's a sort of back door where if you demise the buildings separately, which is what you see here, you can exceed the maximum building length. And so um, one scenario in, um, would be that we would do four buildings and there would be a common wall, you know, as you see here. And that would, that's really the way you maximize the FAR on the site. Now, I see. we've gone to the BRB and asked for a departure that would effectively let us eliminate that interior partition wall, right? And, right. and they, have, um, they have indicated that they're willing to grant that departure. And it's a departure that they have granted for another project in, in the area, too. Right. So I, if your next question is, why is that provision in the code? I have to say, honestly, I have no idea. <laughs> It's well, not, yeah, no, I would, I'm just trying to compare uh, uh, the benefit, you know, um, but okay, a couple more questions. Um, um, the plaza grade or the, the, um, in the, in the alley vacated space, it appears that that walking surface is at several feet above the floor, at least from the renderings. Is that the case? Or the, you know, the, it looks like you're walking here and you're looking down inside the building or. Yeah, that might be. Yeah, that's not the intent, Matt. Yeah, the oh, intent yeah. is that they're built later. Um, they Got will it. be actually stepping some of the building floor plates inside, so we have right. good connectivity with that. Right. Yes. And and uh, somebody already asked what were the program facing elements. They're essentially internal program. Um, and my last question is, I'm interested in this idea of a singular vehicle entry. Um, and so basically, you would be able to get recycle trucks, garbage trucks, and everything to go inside the building and then down. Correct. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly. And so it's. That yeah. So it's a large oversized entry in width and height. It is, yes. Yeah. Because yeah. Essentially 20. Feet. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Um, those are all my questions. I'll pass it on uh till we get to the uh, other next period. Should we go to Benita and then Elaine? Sure. Thank you. Um so I'm gonna go back to the well actually I'll I'll start with a question that relates to the slide and follows up on Matt. So um, what is the actual curb width then for that on John Street that would be needed for this entry? The curb cut. 
curb cut width, that yeah. is. Right. We're in the, um, I believe it, it's 22 to 24. We've been fine tuning that, um, but it's no greater than 24 feet for that, that two way curb cut. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, okay. Um, so I, I appreciate the summary of the community, um, the number of community engagement events you've had, but what I haven't heard <laughs> is what was the feedback you actually received from the community and how are you using that feedback within your design? So if someone could explain that, that would be great. Okay. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, so the the two public outreaches that we did for the um, the general um, open town halls, we didn't have great attendance on those, so there wasn't a ton of feedback out of those. But the Uptown Alliance was a great meeting where we were able to get feedback around the ground plane and the experience at human scale, and really kind of understand from their perspective of like living in the neighborhood, how it feels contextually, how they could see themselves in that space. Um, that was really positive feedback from them. Um, they really liked the way the activation was taking place there and the way it really kind of helped kind of form the neighborhood and kind of started to the expectation for all the neighborhoods to kind of continue to develop in that same mindset and really kind of start to activate and make, you know, extending of the ground plane in, in terms of the, the human scale. So. And that process will go on, you know, with the Uptown Alliance. Yeah, we plan to go back with them as our design evolves and continue to engage with them and engage their feedback. That's great. Just um, this is kind of a comment, but just please make sure to include a slide in the future that yeah. summarizes what you heard at high level and then how you're using that information. Um, and then my my last question, um, and and I realize that you know the no alley vacation here is not obviously as developed as the alley vacation option. But could someone speak to, you know, what would be the expected right of way improvements as a base, you know, as a base requirement for this development, um, as opposed to it, it, I think what you're suggesting is you're going to do more in the right of way than what would be, you know, required by SDOT, um, you know, based on streets illustrated and approved green street plans. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the answer is yes, we're going to have to. I mean, and when we, I mean, as a general matter, um, when we get to public benefits, uh, and Beverly will be watchful uh, on this issue, uh, we need to bring you what the baseline condition is, what's required by code, right. and not just in terms of the right of way, but you know, on site open space and other amenities that, uh, that we may be required in the no vacation condition, and then show what is the delta between that and what we are providing? So, um, so the answer is yes, but we didn't bring that for this presentation. Um, we recognize it's going to be part of uh, what we have to present at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. I'll I'll pass to Elaine. Can I, can I, can I jump in there for just a second? Just to check. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I had, I had my hand up. Um, I just want to caution um, development team. There has been discussion on that topic that Benita just asked about in the past. Um, we are not seeing the expanded sidewalk on 6th and Taylor as being part of the public benefit. We see that as being necessary to meet the uh, street type standard, um, which would significantly narrow the, the street type standard is significantly more narrow um, than the roadway that is existing on those two branches right now. Um, so I think I have made that comment before, um, but just to want to make sure everybody's tracking, um, we right now do not see that as being a public benefit. We see that as being a, um, a minimum requirement. And just uh, Jackson, to assure you, uh, we are tracking that comment. <laughs> okay, <laughs> great. Yeah, it is on our list, and, and I think we want to talk to you some more about it, but uh, we definitely are uh, watchful of that, so. Great. Can, can, you, can you clarify, Jackson, did you say 6th and Thomas or 6th and Taylor? 6th and Taylor. I'm sorry if I misspoke, but I meant 6th and Taylor. Oh, so both of those streets. Yes, both 6th and Taylor. 
Okay. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, I don't have a lot of questions because I think the majority of them have been asked, but I, I think I would, um, I was also curious about really tracking um, community feedback in terms of asks, because um, it does seem like right now the main focus is on sort of enhanced, you know, pedestrian experience. Um, and I was just curious if there were no kind of stated amenities, you know, other than enhanced walkways um, that people would be looking for. So, cause there's not, um, you know, within the, the alley itself in between the buildings, it's a, it's a relatively narrow path. Um, you know, there is, there's some interest and in so forth to walking into that space, but I'm just curious, like what, what other things might people in the neighborhood be looking for? Um, specifically as opposed to just walking through and then and i'm also interested in understanding more of the the numbers regarding you know what's required in terms of um you know open space and what's being provided as part of the public benefit so i think that's it for now thank you Benita, I don't know if you saw a volume and I whispering intently. Uh, um, here's my sense, Commissioner. I think that there is some, what I've been hearing so far from your questions is that there's some general support for this proposal, but there's a slate of information that's needed before you're willing to take any sort of action. Uh, I think they're really good things to be asking about the relationship between what is actually generating pedestrian traffic and what is its role with what your proposal is in concert with maybe a curbside management program that isn't aligning with that reality and a few other things. So if this approach sounds good with Benita and with our action taker Amalia, maybe have the commissioner provide the team with specific direction about what you need to see at a future meeting on some of the issues that you've raised. Does that make sense? Yeah, if I could just say, I think what, one of the things we're, we're seeing is there's inconsistent comparison between the no alley vacation and the alley vacation. And so sometimes we're getting a lot of information on the the alley vacation, but to Elaine's point, there's less to compare that to. What is the difference in the open space? What is the difference in the right of way uses? What is the difference? And so it makes it difficult to compare the, 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 the trust piece so that then we can, the next step of the benefit of like, what are we going to see in addition to that? Or what are the opportunities that are in addition to that? Is that a, a reasonable assessment, Benita? Yes, um, thank you. I agree. So um, I guess starting with Matt, Benita, and Elaine, and then we'll walk the room, any specific direction or request that you want to see uh, based upon the presentation today, Matt? Okay, yeah, I'm interested to see more about the character of the pedestrian space in the vacated alley. And I, I think what I'd like to, uh, so hope that it gets developed in, 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 in that it really feels that a person walking down the sidewalk can psychologically understand that that's a place that they can go as opposed to some kind of threshold that makes it feel like it's a campus that's not for them. And I understand there's not program elements, you know, there's not a cafe that they can use, but it feels like right now that the design's very idiosyncratic and kind of particular once you get inside there. And it does, and so I guess what I'm wondering is that could it be developed with a little less kind of particularity and a little bit more materiality or, or, or you know, feel that it feels like it's part of the pedestrian right away, even though it's, you know, a vacated alley. That's, I guess, I guess that's what I'd like to see more of is how does that pedestrian space actually feel like a public walkway or inviting to public, you know, as opposed to somebody walking down John and thinking, well, I'm, I can't go in there. That's not, I'm, that's not for me. And I guess I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Anita. Great, thank you. Uh, and and I, I just want to start to thank. You. I uh, appreciate all of you um, coming today with this presentation. There's a lot of great information here, and I think I think it's a great start. There's just 
some places that we're, we're looking for more detail. Um, and uh, one of those things would be, um, you know, I appreciate that there's a concept starting here with this idea of a desire route from Denny Park to Seattle Center, which I, I think for some people, you know, that idea of connecting open spaces is a great thing, but we also know that there's a lot more differentiated movements and, and that is perhaps one pathway. So how, you know, where are pedestrians, bicycles coming from? What are the planned um, improvements um, for in terms of bicycle facilities um, that will be coming to Thomas Street and other corridors? You know, what are the, the base requirements that, uh, as Jackson just noted on Six and Taylor, that would be, you know, in the no alley vacation. So we can, we can understand all of that comprehensively. Um, and then, you know, connect that to the, the justification of how you've developed the open space concept here. Um, I, and, and just, you know, include dimensioning for things like curb cuts and, and whatnot, that would be helpful. Um, and as I mentioned before, really, we, we do want to see the summary of the community outreach in terms to be really quite specific um, in terms of what you've heard and how are you utilizing that information um, in the approach. Um, you know, I appreciate that you're doing it and sometimes it may be challenging to get people to come to meetings and 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 so how are you, you know, getting uh, making sure you're hearing from um, people in the neighborhood adjacent uh, groups, uh, stakeholders, and whatnot. Okay, and that's it. I will pass to Elaine. Thanks, Renee. Yeah, um, and I think, you know, I have similar requests um, in terms of wanting yeah. more specific okay. community okay. feedback um, on amenities. I, um, you know, it seems, and, and also wanting to understand more of the character of those spaces. I think when I look at some of the imagery, I'm, I'm looking at slide 35 right now, I'm seeing a very narrow interior space. And I think, I think in plan, um, you know, it looks more open um, than when you look at the, the three-dimensional images. I mean, I appreciate the architecture. I think the archways are, um, are very interesting, but they're also very heavy. Um, and so there's, there's an element where um, I don't know that I would necessarily be drawn to walk through this space. I think as Matt was saying, like, let's, let's talk more about what, uh, what makes this feel like a public space. I think it's pretty clear on the edges, on the you know uh, northwest and southeast corners, that that you're trying to create some public space. But I'd love to learn more about what is happening in those spaces. Is there a bench? Is it just a tree? Or you know, um, are there dog amenities for people who live in the neighborhood? Things like that. Um, so really wanting to understand more there. And then I'm, I was also curious. Um, if there are other, you know, in terms of like the network of these new types of, um, you know, pedestrian alleyways in the neighborhood that are, um, I guess, providing some other connections. And I know that there's been a few other developments recently, and it's hard for me to track like where they where they've ended up in the general neighborhood. But um, I don't know if there's any precedent imagery of maybe things that have worked well or, or haven't worked well in the past that might be interesting. And then I'm all, and, and because I think so much of this application is really um, focused on those two, you know, open spaces, really kind of making sure that they're like going above and beyond um, and understanding, you know, that the actual area that's being contributed to the, to the public realm, I think will be important. I think those are my comments. Thank you. Thanks, Elaine. Elizabeth? Um, I second a lot of what, what's been said and and also appreciate for everyone in the room. It's great. First time I've been in a while. Um, I, I think uh, added to uh, information about um, public involvement, I would want to see very specific demographics of with whom we've 
spoken or interacted. I also acknowledge the, the challenges of being at, at a distance from Seattle. Not all of you are, some of you are local. And so I, th I, I would like to have more of a sense that time has been spent um, uh, not just in, in the neighborhood, but also with neighbors. Um, I think I, uh, I, I appreciate that the Uptown Alliance was really enthusiastic. That is a very small portion and a very limited demographic of the people who are going to be, going to be uh, using these spaces and also who are using alleys now. I, um, interestingly enough, the, a lot of the planning for Cascade and South Lake Union back in the 90s revolved around alleys. So I think you might want to look that up. Um, and also, um, if, if you are proposing a re a reimagined alley for um, these neighborhoods, I think it'd be really good to, to, to see how the existing alley is, because it, it, it is both uh, uptown Lord Man and, and um, South Lake Union and Cascade beyond really do use these alleys, and they're an important part of the, the city infrastructure and the street grid. Um, it is a very, very, you, you've already said it's a very diverse community. So I would like some kind of sense that that, 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 that diverse community has, has, at this early stage, had some sense of what you're thinking about and talking about. And, and what I would suggest now that we're a little more unmasked is to do some walking around the neighborhood groups. You know, not, not do it to, at any kind of distance, including in a room somewhere, but, but, but actually get out there in the streets and, and see how, see, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to do something pretty ambitious. And, and I think it, it needs to be, it needs to definitely be a, a benefit that's above what is existing, but also that connects with um, how, the, how these neighborhoods, we, we do have a respect for the history of these neighborhoods, and I think it needs to be honored in, in very, um, in, in more specificity than to where alleys are concerned. Um, I don't think you necessarily need to make a, um, a nod back to Seattle Center architecture. I think that is um, a reference that may not have anything to do with this being a, um, a delightful and welcoming and accessible uh, public space because Seattle Center is there, it has its own context. I think this is you may not need to spend time and energy on, on that on that reference. There may be something that emerges more specifically from your interactions with neighbors that's that's much much more based in current reality, current groups in Syria now. I think that's it. Okay. Great, thanks, Elizabeth, uh, and thanks to the team. I, you know, I think this is a really wonderful project, and I think it clearly is a, a baseline. Um, I actually think that, if I understand correctly, and I saw your slide on your last slide that you know kind of outlines some of your proposed public benefits. Um, I do think your your heart connection is a really important idea, a really big idea. Um, and you know, Elaine said it and Matt said it, but could you flip to slide fifty one? Um, you know, I don't want to design the building for you, and I think you guys are doing a, a wonderful job at that. But I, just to put a kind of a finer point on this, I think if that is your main idea and the main public benefit, and Elaine picked this up, um, oh, sorry, it's the same thing as me too, earlier. Um, but I think really finding a way to make that as kind of open visually as possible. Um, when I look at some of these renderings, it, it looks uh, a little bit hard to know that you can connect through there and kind of make those. Um, connection. So finding ways to lighten that up and really welcome people through that space. And then kind of building on that, if if I understood correctly, and I think what I was hearing is that's kind of one of the main public benefits. Um, it might be that um, helping those connections across um, Thomas and John could also be um, something that the team could explore that um, kind of pushes out into the neighborhood and maybe doesn't benefit your site as much, but might help uh, connect the neighborhood together. Um, so really thinking, I think, about neighborhood connectivity um, very specifically could be something that could be explored um, in a later phase. But um, overall, I think this is a wonderful concept. And I'm, um, I think I also wanted to point out, I, it seems like the moving your access off of Thomas Street actually um, 
also is a public benefit. Uh, I think the S-top folks said that, but really uh, allowing Thomas to be um, a green street that it wants to be seems important. Um, and so I appreciate that. And then there's one I want to make. Um, oh, about yourself, sh shifting the uh, park south. You know, I don't know whether, I don't think that actually is a public benefit, but I just wanted to uh, commend the team and say, I think that's a, a, a design improvement that provides more opportunity um, and is, a, is nice to see. So, um, so thanks. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I've enjoyed watching the evolution of design, and I think you're doing a great job with that, <coughs> leading and developing your own program. Our challenge is to stay zoomed out and, and not get lost in all of it. That, that, and I think staying zoomed out, one is that the, if the pedestrian counts are tied to old uses of a hotel and service parking lot, they're really not. That's not really going to be going forward. So I think you are going to have to figure out a way to, to bring that up, and, and, and that increases the need for the outreach and creatively doing it. I think Elizabeth's idea of being off the streets not a bad one <laughs> on a nice day like today, but you're not going to rain. We do need to see the connections and the crossings. Um, we do need to understand the character of Thomas and John. Um, I, I buy into the idea of the desire line. Um, there is something about the topography of that whole area that the minute you start to do a diagonal, everyone's happy. Um, and so I would look at Fisher Bluff. Um, some, Elaine, I think, brought up the idea of uh, other uh, examples. And um, that one over the years has been relatively successful the way that it opens up for the sales on campus. Um, the challenge on it is getting off the monorail and finding your way to it, right? right. And I think you have a you have an, uh, an advantage over that. The advantage they have is they put you on Denning, which might be a better way to get to Denning Park than John. But um, I think there's examples there. I think I think there's all kinds of um, stuff that you can look at to help with us make that bigger that bigger argument. So that's what I. Do. Yeah. Well, you want to close this with anything? I do. So. Um, Gonna, can I just summarize what what I heard to make sure? Uh, and if you can, I would be so <laughs> impressed. I was prepared to the recording, but you do it. Um, so I'm just gonna <laughs> remind everyone that here we're really focused on um, the public trust analysis component. We all recognize that the benefit, the details around the benefits are gonna come later. And so um, in the guise of that, I think that some things that just wanted to summarize that um, you know, really what we're looking at is an evaluation of the no vacation and the, the vacation alternatives. And so we do, we all acknowledge that there was a lot of really great information about the, 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 the vacation alternative. And while we understand you're not, you know, there's a balance of how much we're going to get, we'd like some better comparison so we can make those understandings again, to set the, to set the foundation for the public benefit conversation. And so Generally, um, you know, we are all very supportive of the movements of the buildings in comparison. You know, you, you spent a lot of time talking about the, the placement of the buildings. There were some, some comments about that, which you'll see in the notes and that you've heard. Um, and that we, we are generally um, seems to be very supportive of that diagonal movement. That makes a lot of sense. You've made a lot of connections about that. But what we're, I think, really want to kind of focus on is that those interactions. Right, that that it felt that there was a a, a just uh, they weren't connected, that the movements weren't overlaid to each other, that they felt like isolated in their analysis, and we want you to be really thoughtful and um, mindful about if you're going to present us with data, which we love, then be be thoughtful about is it really valuable, is it really relevant to what we're we're talking about, and how this space is going to move forward, um, and in general, like we we love open space, we think it's great. However, we just want to make sure the space is welcoming. And that, again, that kind of baseline, like what public space, what green factor, what street trees, what, what right-of-way improvements are a baseline that would be included in that no, no vacation alternative. And then what is, what are you seeing as the opportunity with the, with the vacation to add the benefit? And that's where we're, we're just seeing a, a disconnect. Um, and then I just want to say that I um, appreciate all the comments from um, Beverly and Jackson, particularly, and your acknowledgement that you've got some pretty significant utility concerns from SPU and SCL, and that you're working on those, and that you just put that in the baseline. Um, and then last, I think, just around the space, um, 
the, the public assembly, the urban form, again, a more comparison of how that, that is different between the two um, alternatives and, and being really mindful about those visual connections, feeling welcoming, um, how are, you know, is, is there really gonna be no, like if I'm in the middle of this space or any of us are in the middle of that space, is there any public amenity for us? Um, or are we just, do we really just have to continue to move through? Is it a through movement for the public? Um, and that really the, 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 the engagement with each other is happening on those corners. Um, so it just felt there was some, some disconnect around that. Um, and then I think just in general, we love the light and air of the building. Just want a little bit more information about, again, the no action and this and these arches and, and just kind of, again, how these spaces feel like they're meant to be really for the people that are in the building coming out and having an outdoor space or for the public and kind of how how that um, works between the, the two options. I think that's it. Excellent. Um, thank you. Really incredibly helpful presentation. It really helped, I think, give you some good direction in terms of adding a fine point to a problem. I think that the commission understands the relative value mm -hmm. of what you're proposing. Sure. It's understanding some of the math and then the reality of why people would actually use the space. Well, yeah, I think we've got, uh, this is all tremendously helpful to us too. We got lots of notes. Um, it, it's always the dividing line in my mind between the public trust conversation, the public right. benefit conversation is always, you know, very well, right? And, so I think our lesson is we probably heard on the side of staying too far on the one and not engaging enough of that conversation. So I think when we come back, and fair warning to you, we're going to get more into the public benefit thing, not asking for your approval of it, but I think kind of having a merged presentation probably. So we'll that's a lot of what I hear. Yeah. Thank you all. Great, thank you. Thank you. We'll see you again in person. I know. Maybe we should have this meeting here with the neighborhood because there we have go. a room full of what? Commissioners, uh, we're we're gonna pick back up at one o'clock with Victoria's presentation, maybe showing up about five minutes early for that. But otherwise, we will see you in about forty-five minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I just... pending, but there are, uh, Victoria, we have about 10 or 11 people from city departments who are attending as well. I've sent out an email and a number of people in um, our department at OPCD and the Seattle Department of Construction and Inspections who are interested in the issue are attending. So we have a, a larger audience for you. Uh, I'm going to... If Elaine, do you want to kind of set up an introduction quickly? Yeah. And will the camera look at me because I don't, I'm not on the. I see you, Elaine. Oh, you see me. Okay. Mm -hmm. It switched over. Okay. Well, great. Um, so I, so with us is Victoria Montaigne, and I had the benefit of meeting Victoria a couple of years ago when I first started working in Northern Virginia for a project I'm doing um, through my work. And, um, and Victoria reached out to me a year or so ago um, here in Seattle and was telling me about the study and work that she was doing uh, regarding equity in architecture and the built environment. And, you know, um, being on the Seattle Design Commission, it was just such, of such great interest to me. And, you know, Benita and I had taken one of the equity workshops couple of years ago, it was before I met Victoria. And since then, I've just been really perplexed about how we, how we think about our built spaces and how we could, um, you know, how we integrate equity in architecture. And there's just a lot of different lenses that you can look at it through. And so when Victoria and I met and started having this conversation, um, I thought it was worth really sharing with others. And so I'm going to let Victoria do more a formal introduction in terms of her background and training, but she's um, working towards her PhD at North Carolina State University, and then also working with Stephen Winter Architects in New York as a researcher. And, you know, I think today, you know, 
love to hear about the research that you're doing, but then we also allowed a lot of time to just have yeah. an open dialogue and discussion so we could talk more about how we how we might think about applying it in our public spaces. And then Victoria, before you start, um, why don't we do a quick round of introductions with commissioners and um, introduce yourself in the role that you play on the board and we'll start in the room and then we'll uh, send it to our virtual colleagues, Elaine. Yes, yeah, so Elaine Wine, one of the architect commissioners. Elizabeth Connor, artist commissioner. Hi, Adam Amrai, I'm an urban planning commissioner. Hi, Jill Crary, at large commissioner. Uh, Molly Layton Cody, Transportation Planner Commissioner. And Vanita Sidhu, our chair. Yeah, Vanita Sidhu, Landscape Architect Commissioner and Chair. And we've met Victoria. I don't know that we've actually seen each other in person, but for the record, Michael Jenkins, the Director of the Design Commission. Valerie Kinas, Staff to the Commission. And Wendy. Wendy Bandiker, Staff Design Commission. Great. Thank you, and Victoria, we have you till 2.30. So I'm going to let, uh, throw it your way. Awesome, great. Well, it's really lovely to meet everyone. I apologize for my delayed entry, but hopefully we'll have enough time. Um, Elaine provided a great overview of how I came to have these discussions with the commission. Uh, I'll give a little bit more information on my background. Uh, I'm actually not an architect or a designer. I have a background in public policy, so I come to this with a policy lens. Uh, but I've been working with architects and designers uh, for a little over 15 years. I started my work uh, really focused on inclusive and universal design initiatives. I also became interested in healthy building really early on. I think um, I was thinking about it the other day, if I remember, I was one of the first in uh, the first cohort of WELL APs back in 2017. So I was on the WELL bandwagon quite early. And more recently, my work has uh, taken an equity-centered approach, and I'm excited to share a bit more about what that means. Uh, and so in my role at Stephen Winter Associates, I'm leading a research initiative that's centered on equity, health, and inclusive design. Uh, and as Elaine mentioned, I'm also wrapping up my doctoral research uh, in the spring that's focused on understanding how we operationalize equity in the built environment. And so I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing a bit about my work, but then also having a, an engaging discussion with you all and seeing perhaps where there might be uh, room to support each other in our efforts to advance equity. So with that, I will share my screen, hopefully. This is the one I want. And I'm going to do this. Okay, do you all see my uh, slide? Yes. Good. Perfect. All right. So our agenda for today, um, I thought we'd start by just talking a little bit about what equity means in the context of the built environment. In many ways, this is still an emerging concept, and so we'll, we'll discuss um, kind of where we're at today. And then I'll spend about 20 minutes sharing some of my ongoing research, uh, the first of which is my uh, dissertation research. The second is a, a grant that I support that's held by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation around measuring outcomes related to health equity. I'll spend just a few minutes sharing a, uh, an initiative that we're really excited about at Stephen Winter Associates, which is connecting the idea of building performance with equity. But then, as I said, we're really gonna leave a lot of time for discussion, Q&A, um, really see how we can um, you know, connect and work together. So as I'm sure we're all aware, uh, particularly given recent social and political climates, equity has risen to the top of agendas across disciplines, including architecture. So for anyone who may be paying attention, we're seeing a lot of practitioner resources come to market at rapid speed. The International Well Building Institute recently introduced the Well Equity Rating. Um, we've also had practitioner frameworks like the Design Justice Principles that were established a few years ago that talk about embedding uh, equity and social justice in the design process. 
uh, as well as resources that look at operations and planning and development and, and so on. But when it really comes down to it, what is equity in the built environment? This is a seemingly easy question, but often if you ask practitioners or designers this question, you will get varied responses, um, sometimes blank stares, which I can attest to because I often ask practitioners this question in my research. And I think that's okay because unlike disciplines like employment or healthcare or education, we're really just beginning to address what equity means within the context of the built environment. And so, of course, there are a lot of pathways to take when we're talking about advancing equity. Oftentimes, there's a focus on the community engagement piece, elevating voices from underserved uh, communities, particularly those that are often overlooked in the design process, which is very important. Um, you can also look at operations and management. For me, where I'm really interested in building research right now is that physical form. So what does equity look like when it's translated into the design of the built environment? And so this is really a concept that is um, largely just emerging and to help myself and to also help explain kind of the way that I think about equity, I'm putting together a working definition to put some parameters around this, which at this point in time is the just and fair inclusion through the design of the built environment by removing barriers and making enhancements to ensure all occupants can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. And all of this really requires that we recognize that we don't experience the built environment starting from the same place. So as I began to explore equity within this context a little bit more, I dove uh, very deeply into literature around barriers that exist in the built environment. And I saw very early on that a lot of barriers exist that impact end users based on individual and intersectional identities, including race, gender, LGBTQ plus identity, disability, among many others. Some examples uh, that I can share with you that I pulled from uh, research studies uh, were perceptions of white versus non-white spaces that were held by people of color. Um, another study showed that women are disparately impacted by factors related to uh, features of the built environment, like residential density, street connectivity, and crime safety. And then instances where queer or LGBTQ plus safe spaces are relegated to underground or undesirable locations historically um, because of the need to want to have that secrecy and privacy. And so these barriers are very broad reaching and um, quite complex to wrap our arms around. So to bring some more clarity, I kind of bucketed these barriers into categories. Those are physical, those that are physical in nature, and those that are spatial. To give you an idea of what those barriers can look like, um, you know, physical barriers are arguably the most distinct obstacles that we'll see in built environments. A very common example would be stairways, steep ramps. Uh, narrow doorways that might infringe upon someone's ability to use or navigate or access a building space or community. But we're seeing other forms of physical barriers as well. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with the term hostile architecture, um, but this has been uh, kind of bubbling up in urban areas. And it's really this idea of incorporating design features like teeth along fences, bolsters in public walkways, uh, the omission of public benches in parks, or in this case uh, that I'm showing here on the right, uh, putting uh, railings on public benches to kind of prevent loitering or long periods of rest. And hostile architecture is projected to disparately impact youth, homeless populations, uh, as well as elderly who are more often uh, likely to use public spaces. So these are both two examples of physical barriers that exist. There are others, but hopefully that brings uh, a little bit more clarity. And then we also have spatial barriers, which are certainly more abstract, but uh, nevertheless, 
equally as important to recognize. And really the idea of spatial barriers comes from many scholars who in the past have said that our spaces within buildings are not neutral or value-free spaces. Instead, they come with um, aspects of power and dominance and social status. So there can be this idea of both claiming space or owning and occupying it, as well as the way we order and kind of distribute space. So a really common example that I think puts this into parameters that we can all understand is this idea of the executive office. You know, what does it mean to own and occupy that space connected with your power within that organization or company um, versus on the kind of flip side of that, what does it look like to not have that space? Uh, and maybe, um, you know, this is definitely a trend in the 1960s and 70s that impacted women in the workplace who were typically kind of centered in this pool or like a work pit, which is, was, was often um, described as. And so both physical and spatial barriers are really critical to understanding what our, what our job, what our, really our job is and how to approach equity in the built environment by dismantling these barriers that exist and also understanding how we get ahead of those barriers in the first place. Uh, and so really when we think about that, these barriers become an issue of equity when individuals may experience buildings, communities, and spaces differently um, and when those outcomes negatively and disparately affect marginalized populations. So really we're thinking about the experience of buildings and spaces that may not be the same for everyone because of both physical and spatial barriers that exist. So with this kind of framed as a question of equity, I wanted to understand more deeply how we as a discipline, as you know, the architecture and design discipline, how are we addressing equity in the built environment? What are our key strategies? What are common themes? What are best practices? Um, because much like I'm sure uh, you all may be interested in, in this topic, I've been watching a lot of practitioner resources come to market and seemingly there were um, themes that were emerging, but still variations. So I wanted to kind of see what I could pull out as commonalities. I took a review of about 15 practitioner resources that were aimed at addressing equity in the built environment, whether that was the full framework like the well health, or excuse me, like the well uh, equity rating I mentioned, or whether that might have been a portion of a larger standard like the integrated design neighborhood fabric uh, within enterprise green communities. So I really wanted to kind of isolate that piece that was intended to address equity. And very early on, I saw that there were some key themes around how we as a discipline address equity. The first of which was participatory design or kind of community engaged design. Everyone agreed, all of these resources agreed that tapping into the community, elevating those voices um, is critical in addressing equity. Another trend was community engagement. So looking um, beyond that kind of direct design feedback, but looking at you know, who might we tap into um, within the community and other stakeholders. Might we have a cultural advisory board? Might we um, continue that throughout the entire life cycle of the project, not just in the design phase? So really kind of building those relationships. And then the third approach that was very prominent was around operations and management. So looking at um, supporting either uh, end user leadership teams or um, other kind of leadership groups to have robust diversity, equity, and inclusion plans or ensuring fair labor and operations policies, et cetera. Uh, what was very interesting to me in these reviews is that less often discussed were actual design interventions for addressing equity in the built environment. And I found that particularly interesting because 
arguably we might think that because these are architecture resources, um, design is kind of the main um, the main skill set, the main intent of the practitioners using these resources, and kind of the main intent of of the project. Um, and so I wanted to understand a little bit more how we could begin to understand what these design interventions look like. And this interest certainly stems from my background in inclusive and universal design, which is very focused on um, bringing those design interventions to the physical built environment. But also more importantly, it was of great interest to me to understand how we are going to begin measuring equity. What are the outcomes and how, how do we know when we've achieved it and why it's important to address it? And for me, uh, when I put my arms around this, it's really the first step is understanding what does equity look like in the built environment so we know how and what to measure. And so the review of the practitioner resources coupled with the uh, outcome of the literature, which shows um, barriers that exist based on race, gender, and LGBTQ plus identity, really helps to underscore the research gap that I am currently aiming to address through my dissertation research. So with that, I'll hop into sharing what that study looks like. Um, and again, it's really focused on what I'm calling operationalizing equity, which is just kind of a way of saying, how are we achieving it or how are we embedding equity in the design of the built environment? And so I'm approaching this through a qualitative case study, uh, particularly to address the primary research question, how is equity operationalized in the built environment? I created very clear case project parameters um, beginning with, of course, that fundamental idea that these had to be community-engaged projects that were designed um, not only with and, with and by and for the community, with and by the community, but also for the community. So really the aim is uh, elevating the needs of marginalized groups. Uh, also to maintain a kind of a current lens, these projects were completed on or before on or after January 1st. They had to have uh, notably adopted an equity lens in the design process, which I confirmed with a discussion uh, prior uh, with lead uh, community and practitioner members. And then I also uh, concertedly chose projects that were in dispersed locations that varied across project type. So I didn't want to pick all K through 12 schools and I didn't want to land on all um, public uh, projects. I really wanted to understand if equity uh, was tied to project typology or if it, unlike you know, other building rating systems, if it kind of would transcend that. And so the four projects um, I landed on, um, I'll introduce each separately. The first is the Memorial at Harvey Milk Plaza, is, uh, which is located in San Francisco. It is being co-designed by the Friends of Harvey Milk, which is a nonprofit organization, as well as SWA group. Um, this is actually different than my SWA, Stephen Winter Associates, um, but it's really funny that we have uh, the same initials. Uh, but they're an architecture firm located in San Francisco. And the intent of this project is to modernize a transit stop in San Francisco uh, that is really geared towards celebrating and honoring the legacy of Harvey Milk. Um, and this is a very, uh, LGBTQ plus inclusion is very much at the center of this project and was very much at the center of the design process. The second case uh, is the women's building in New York City. Uh, this is um, a, unfortunately a project that was never fully realized. Uh, however, the design process was very robust, so there's a lot to be gleaned around concepts that focus on gender and gender equity in design. Uh, the team that worked on this was the Novo Foundation, as well as Deborah Burke Partners. And this project focused on transforming uh, what uh, is and was a former correctional, women's correctional facility to a hub of women's empowerment, 
and so this is definitely a, uh, a look at how gender can be elevated and expressed in design. The third project is Norman Sims Elementary, located in East Austin, Texas. This was designed by uh, the folks at Norman Sims Elementary, the amazing staff and faculty uh, there, as well as the families and even the students were involved. Uh, and this was on the practitioner side led by Kirksey Architects. So this was a modernization and also a consolidation school project. Uh, and very much this adopted a racial equity lens. Norman Sims serves predominantly black and Latinx students. And so really elevating the needs of um, of this community was a top priority. And then the fourth project, which I'm sure all of you uh, are familiar with, is the Wing Luke Museum of the Asian Pacific American Experience in Seattle. Um, I was actually just in Seattle a couple of weeks ago doing a visit of this amazing space, um, and I felt so lucky to have the tour that I did um, with both the folks at the Wing Luke, um, as well as SKL Architects, who led the practitioner side of this. Um, and really, this was a highly community-engaged approach. I'll be curious to see if any of you were involved or familiar with that, with that process. Um, and uh, again, this is a modernization of a historic site um, to really elevate the needs and priorities of um, Asian American uh, the Asian American community in Seattle, as well as Asian immigrants in Seattle. So my research methods are really centered on tapping into the takeaways that not only the practitioners had from the design process, but also the community members. So there is that equity piece of really making sure that um, both of those ideas align. Uh, and so I'm starting with interviews with both practitioners as well as community members, uh, really gaining a perspective on what were the goals, how were those goals achieved, and what ultimately does that look like in the design. Uh, I've also conducted a site visit for projects that are in a completed phase where I can do so, uh, and also doing document review, looking at plans, looking at photos, uh, and any type of documentation I can get from the teams around the design process, meetings, et cetera. And so ultimately, I'm again looking to answer that question, how is equity operationalized in the design of the built environment? So while I'm still undergoing my uh, analysis at this point, I can share a few preliminary findings, um, starting with the finding that when we're looking at goals that were elevated by communities across all four projects, there were a lot of shared goals, and I've listed some here. I definitely anticipated that there would be some shared goals, but more interestingly, I'm seeing that there are shared strategies for achieving these goals. So as an example, many community members expressed they, that they wanted to have a sense of representation or feel, feel visible um, throughout the project. And in all four cases, that was achieved directly by having either permanent or temporary art installations and exhibits. So an example of what that looks like in a couple of these projects, on the left-hand side, there is an image of an art installation in the Wing Luth Museum that's called, I think, um, Letter Cloud. And these are letters that were written um, by uh, Asian immigrants uh, back home to family members. And there's also an audio loop that plays that uh, reads those letters aloud. Uh, on the right um, top hand side, there is an image of a revolving uh, gallery in the Harvey, the Memorial at Harvey Milk Plaza. This was really important to the team, particularly as they thought about representation, uh, not only for Harvey Milk, who is a gay white male, but also looking at how we nod to other groups within the LGBTQ community. So looking at uh, lesbians, trans, people of color who identify as LGBTQ+. And so this is a space that will continue to revolve uh, and reflect the priorities and needs of that community, those communities. And then on the bottom right-hand side is an image from Norman Sims Elementary. 
they call this the history wall, which is uh, really, really great. Uh, and essentially, it has images of the founders of the school, Norman and Sims. Uh, and um, particularly, this is so powerful because both of these educators were people of color who led and pioneered education in STEM. And also, interestingly, there's a lot of personal notes that reflect the East Austin community on this history wall as well. So in each of these instances, this was a strategy that was used to achieve visibility and representation across these projects. Another example that uh, came about were the goals around legacy and history. Uh, and I should have expressly mentioned that each of these projects were, in a sense, a modernization. So there was this idea and this importance around preserving aspects of history and culture and what not only those spaces mean, but also the ability to be within those spaces and keep that culture and tradition. And so, again, um, certainly it was anticipated that legacy and history would be a goal within these projects. But I noticed that the way that that was achieved was through optional historic experiences. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, um, how can I put this? So rather than create um, a space that was mandatory for every user to kind of go through, the design teams, in fact, realized that honoring legacy and history in certain instances is quite um, emotional or introspective. And so on the top left-hand side, you see an image from the Wing Luke Museum, which is a preserved um, room from the building in its original form, where at the time an Asian immigrant may have lived um, by himself or by him or herself or with family. And so this area of the museum, uh, for those of you who, who may not have been there, is kind of segmented from the rest of the museum. So you could go through the museum theoretically without necessarily kind of stopping and, and visiting the sections. Similarly, on the bottom left-hand side, this is an image of a uh, former cell in the Women's Correctional Facility in uh, the Women's Building, New York. And it was very important during the community engagement process to not only preserve one of these cells, but also to um, keep it in a place that could be visited by, um, uh, by people coming into that space if they wanted to relive and honor those experiences of what the building used to be. And then on the right-hand side, you know, we think about the Harvey Milk Memorial it's in a sense a public transit stop. So everyone will be using this space, um, you know, regardless for transportation needs. But also there are these very engaging aspects around it. Um, this is an image of a podium that has the word hope in it that was very much largely part of Harvey's um, legacy and mission to instill hope and activism in, in others. And so these are components of the project that could be experienced if you want uh, that honor history and legacy, but if the user should choose not to participate in that, they also serve their um, typical kind of traditional form. So those are just some very beginning findings, uh, but ultimately my goal through my research is to develop a set of almost universal or shared goals around um, designing for equity, and then understanding how we can begin to pull out some targeted strategies of design interventions. Understanding that some of these may intersect and then some may be different. Uh, and so this framework ideally would be used not in lieu of community engagement. Always community engagement is the best, but it could be a framework that supports uh, community engagement rather than kind of starting from the ground up. And then also in a way that we understand and recognize that many projects are being built today without that level of community engagement. So whether that's due to lack of budget or due to um, limited interest from the client, 
um, this would be a framework that could support practitioners that want to embed equity in the built environment, but maybe don't have the space to do that robust community engagement at this time. So the next steps for my research, of course, will be to complete that framework. Uh, as a policy person, I always want to think about informing future design standards, guidelines, and policies. And then definitely looking at, um, I'm getting a lot of information from practitioners uh, around what they would like to see as a resource for addressing equity in the built environment, you know, what's missing and what would be really helpful. And so a potential future project for me um, to seek funding for is actually developing that resource for practitioners. The second project is uh, around measuring health equity outcomes. Um, I mentioned that this is a work that's being funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And uh, I'm very excited to support this, this, uh, this project. It's currently held at North Carolina State University. And essentially, we're looking to address the question, how does the design of, of a school impact the physical, mental, and emotional health of not just the students, but also the faculty and the greater community. So we are looking at uh, one case school that is a K-5 elementary school that's co-located with the YMCA. So this is kind of a unique model um, that's being piloted in certain areas around the country to really bring that concept of community together with education. So it's a very unique uh, space, and it was also very much a community-designed space. Uh, and this process was completed in 2020. It's located in Southeast Raleigh, which is a purpose-built community, 90% non-white, 56% of households earning less than $40,000 a year, and only 21% of adults, um, <clears throat> excuse me, have a college education. So when we think about embedding tenants of health in this space, it very much becomes an issue and a question and, a, and an exploration of, of health equity and, and looking at those outcomes. So this is a picture of the case school um, from the exterior. And again, <clears throat> the way that it looks is, you know, half of this building is basically the YMCA and the other half is an elementary school. And they're very much segmented by a, um, an internal lobby that uh, has a reception desk and kind of two corridors off to either side to enter the school or the YMCA. I'll share just a few images of the project so you can kind of get a feel for some of the strategies that were reflected here. On the left hand side um, is a pavilion and this pavilion and actually the entire exterior site of the school is open to the general public uh, and on that site uh, is also, I don't have a picture of it, unfortunately, but is a, an affordable multifamily housing community uh, that actually houses many of the students uh, that attend the school. So there's this very uh, interconnected um, planning that was developed around both the housing, the exterior, as well as the school itself, school and YMCA itself. So the um, uh, pavilion is open not only to the school, but also to the community to host events, gatherings. Uh, in the summer, there's a, um, uh, what they call the Black Farmers Market to host um, uh, farmers of color who are bringing in produce and goods to share with the community. On the right hand uh, top side, there is a, what's called a meditation circle. This is available to students that may want to head over there during a recess or break. It's also available to the greater community and lots of areas for um, social gathering and even learning outside, which is what's shown on the bottom right hand side. Flexible teaching was really huge in the design of this school. Um, you know, we see different options for seating, chairs that support different learning styles. But then also, if you look a little bit more closely, the um, traditional classrooms are in the back there. And this is actually just a common area that isn't always set up as a classroom, but it can serve as that purpose if one would like it to. 
And this idea kind of weaves throughout the school in different iterations. On the left-hand side is uh, a, an image of the library and a kind of common social uh, area for you know, reading or discussion. And then on the right-hand side is a space uh, also within the library that's more fostered around introspection or quiet or solitude. And so it really supports, again, the idea of different learning styles or different um, needs that students might have. There are a lot of really creative maker spaces in this school as well. Uh, on the right-hand side, we see one of two community gardens. Uh, and then on the left-hand side is a community kitchen where the school hosts uh, events for families of students and also the greater community. Uh, and then you see there they've got some of the produce that was grown in the gardens being shared uh, for um, public use if people would like to take those. And then lastly, there's a lot of elements around active design in this school. So on the left-hand side is actually an indoor walking track. It's technically part of the YMCA, but teachers and staff of the school can access this walking track. Um, and I, I will say that's probably in our interviews with uh, teachers. This is like the biggest hit ever. They absolutely love the indoor walking track. Uh, and almost every single teacher that we spoke with said that they use it on a regular or fairly regular basis. And then on the right hand side, again, just shows that connectivity of the site with exterior greenways that um, really encourage not only um, activity around the site, but then even beyond to a hike or a nature trail, etc. And so our research methods, um, similarly to my dissertation study, center on interviews. So we connected with um, families of students, we connected with teachers, we connected with staff as well as community members to understand how the design of this school um, impacted, uh, impacted them and what their interpretations of it were. We also did a site assessment, so walking through the space, images, taking photos, notes. Uh, and then we are in the process of setting up community canvassing. So getting out to local events, you know, heading to the farmer's market, asking people questions, maybe holding a focus group. And unfortunately, this was really put on hold due to COVID. So we're just getting into tapping into the community right now. Uh, and again, we're looking to answer these questions. How does design impact the physical, mental, and emotional health? So while we are uh, also still in the uh, analysis phase, I can start to share some preliminary findings. And I also wanted to note that even though we are focused on our case school, to really, um, I guess, control for design, we identified a match school that's in the same neighborhood as our K school, same demographic, same kind of like structure to it. The only thing differing is that it does not have that kind of updated design and the, those very health forward design strategies. So we really wanted to kind of isolate the responses that we were getting from our participants that focused as much as it could on design. So just to share some early findings, uh, we asked participants from both our case as well as our match school, um, do you believe that design had a positive impact on students, staff, and the community? And overwhelmingly, it was shown that yes, um, people do agree that the design has a positive impact. And we can see that um, we lumped both the uh, agree and strongly agree together here. So, when we look at, let's say, this first, uh, first response, we see an overwhelmingly agree versus the match school, which is not, not so much. Um, and same when we look at staff, and same then when we talk about community. When asked if the school, the design of the school supports diversity, inclusion, and belonging, again, with our case school, we see uh, a very strong uh, lean towards agree and strongly agree that the design supports diversity, inclusion, and a sense of belonging versus our match school, which does not have as 
strong members there. And then finally, looking at um, just kind of a very high level uh, feedback around whether the design positively impacts physical, mental, and emotional health. Our case school, uh, again, has really strong numbers in um, agree and strongly agree, particularly when it comes to physical activity, you know, thinking back to all of those kind of active spaces, uh, mental health uh, as well, and then uh, social and emotional health. So with that, I'll wrap um, with just a couple of additional slides around an initiative that uh, we're really excited about at Stephen Winter Associates, which is connecting the idea of building performance and equity. And you know, oftentimes when we think about um, building performance, it's traditionally focused on aspects like energy usage and water consumption, maybe thermal comfort, indoor air quality. And these are all really important metrics. But when we think about looking at equity and how that connects with building performance, we really want to understand maybe more deeply, or, or I should say differently, the ways that outcomes can be related to equity. And so unlike kind of these more quantitative measures that are looking at usage and consumption, we're starting to explore how we can bring a qualitative lens to measure equity, looking at value-laden metrics like sense of belonging or feelings of inclusion, taking a sense of pride, ownership, all of these things that are maybe not necessarily quantifiable, but really do go hand in hand when we're talking about something like equity versus maybe something like sustainability that is really um, more geared to be measured through numbers and metrics. And so we are pioneering um, what we're calling inclusive building performance, which aims to rather than kind of silo these approaches around sustainability, efficiency, health, et cetera, to rather view them more as interrelated and really focus on looking at not only aspects of you know, traditional building functionality and environmental impact, but getting into the idea around what are human experiences in space, um, kind of like those that I had been mentioning, as well as how does that impact um, individuals. So this is something that's very much in the beginning stages, uh, but we're very excited uh, about it and I'll look forward to keeping you posted as that work emerges. Our next steps for this um, are certainly to work on identifying equity indicators for the built environment. I kind of hesitate to even use the word indicator in this instance, but for lack of a better word right now, that's kind of what we're landing on. Uh, and then really developing the assessment tools in order to gather this qualitative and quantitative data. Um, because you know, there's a lot out there around how we measure for sustainability and efficiency there's less out there for understanding how we've achieved and how we've succeeded at um, creating and advancing equity through the built environment. And then lastly, you know, unfortunately, um, we often have to, in this discipline, identify the business case for adopting sustainability or for adopting um, efficiency. And so really taking that research and transforming that into or translating that into the why. So why is this important? Why should you care? Why should you put forth that effort to address equity when we're designing these projects? So that is all for me. Um, I'm really looking forward to having a discussion and I actually put together a few prompts um, if that's at all helpful, uh, but otherwise I will turn it over to you all. Um, um, here, I need to mute. Sorry. Sorry. I've been doing so well technologically. <laughs> you um, You know, Caitlin, well, uh, Caitlin, sorry. I'm multitasking as well. Victoria, thank you. Um, it's interesting because question number one 
which is kind of, you and I have spoken a little bit about this. Um, I had sent you the equity policy that the commission uh, uh, developed and has since updated about, I think about a year ago. Um, so much of what the commission, just to kick things off, so much of what the commission does in their review of publicly funded projects benefits from a jurisdiction that has elevated equitable outcomes in their policy decisions to not only fund certain projects, but also demanding that program aligns with, with a, a certain amount of uh, public engagement that the city has established as a baseline. <clears throat> while, it's, while we do some, and we benefit from that, and there's no question that the projects benefit from that, there are a number of people on this call and in our own experience where we deal with private development, that commitment may not be as embedded, required, or expected. And so I guess the question that I'll start off with is, how do you convince private development that it may not be in their interest, it may not be as part of their program, it may not be as part of the mission that they have? How do we embed those values in that and, and expect deliverables from the private sector that we as a city using public funds, using those funds to create public facilities, expect to be embedded in, in outcomes that our electorate says is essential. Um, you're asking me that, right? Well, I think so. I think I'm asking that. I think that the commission struggles yeah. with that at times. Because certainly the, the design commission on its role to oversee publicly funded projects, we see project managers come to us who, for good or for bad, use that as a baseline because city policy demands that they do that. Where the, where the private sector picks up that obligation, I think is a question that we tackle with when we see projects that are privately funded, that come to us because they need to, because there's uh, approval that we have to give. I mean, one of, the, one of the things I think about, Michael, is just, you know, when you say, how do we embed these values? I think that on the, you know, the design community doesn't really know how, like, how to integrate the thinking regarding equity. I mean, and I think, Victoria, that's kind of what you're, getting at in part of this study is to sort of identify like, okay, what, what are some barriers? Like what are enhancements? Like most people would have no idea what would be perceived, you know, what might be perceived as a benefit to, you know, because this is the way we've always done things might be a barrier to other communities. And so I think in, in our work, it seems like how folks are achieving equity is that they're going out and they're talking to communities. Uh, but like this morning we talked to a group that, you know, there was very little input that was given. Maybe people didn't show up because it was COVID. And so, or maybe, I don't know, maybe it wasn't a diverse community that showed up. And so it's like, they just don't know what to do. So I think this idea of like having resources or a toolkit or something is, I mean, I guess the city has a, a toolkit, but I, I don't know that it really speaks to like how, how you integrate it in a design solution. So. You need to be some case studies or something for people who are Yeah, I mean, I was curious, like one of, the, one of the first questions I had for Victoria was like, obviously, you know, you showed some examples of like a space, you know, here's an example of, you know, a spatial intervention, you know, where somebody's got a dominant space right in an office. But just thinking like, have you, interviewed you know, a number of these marginalized communities so that we understand like what feels like a white space to certain groups. Like, I don't know, I'm not sure I know what that means. Yeah, well, I think, so I think it's, I wanna spend less time on asking about barriers and more on looking at solutions. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at the racial equity lens project, Norman Sims Elementary, 
we know that a space that feels good for um, these students of color reflected um, people that look like them, that feel like them, that represent, um, you know, history, culture, et cetera. And then also um, this idea of visibility and ownership of space. So some things that I didn't have time to share, but the students were actively involved in the design of that project. And so many of the art features in there were actually created by students themselves. Like they actually came up with that idea. And so embedding those pieces within the school um, inherently creates that feeling of ownership and representation. And then because we're engaging communities of color, therefore we're kind of dismantling that idea of white space that comes from white ideas. And, you know, I think that if, if this one study is, is not enough, like it's going to be an entire, you know, for me, an entire career, but then also across our discipline as people begin to emerge and kind of start to continue to research this, there's a lot of, of more, a, a lot more knowledge that's needed. And then Michael, just to answer your first question around how do we get private developers to be interested in this? That is the crux of my interest in question, because in my experience, I have worked in private practice. I, I was working in-house with an architecture firm that very much there was interest there in embedding equity from the designers, but the client was like, "Why are what, that's not our priority. We don't want to do it. We don't have time for it. We don't have it in the budget. So I'm looking at kind of like this um, pronged approach looking at policy as a driver. So where can we adopt that when uh, it makes sense to do so? Kind of like you have the authority and ability to do with projects that come through the commission. Looking at maybe uh, ESGs and how we can build more robust commitments to equity for people who are giving the dollars for those developments. Um, and then also what I had mentioned around building that business case. So having the data of why this is important. But I don't think right now we have a lot uh, available to us that um, that makes that easy to do. Benita, okay. oh, sorry. Okay. I was just gonna recognize our chair, Benita, who politely has her hand raised. Thank you, Benita. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know, I think the, am I the only commissioner online this time? <laughs> Um, but, uh, well, so I was going to say, maybe kind of adding on to what Michael said, and, and I think I might come at this from a different lens because I'm a landscape architect by profession and I work on a lot of public projects and I've been working a lot on K through 12 schools and parks mm -hmm. and inherently they've had participatory design processes and been you know, equity has been a goal from the beginning, um, unlike the bulk of the work I do. So to me, it's, it is like, it's obvious, but it's not to everybody. Um, and um, I guess, but the difference in those projects that are starting with the public or nonprofits is um, the, the definition of the process from the beginning and then also like clear end users I think like, especially in a school, it's like really easy to define that. And then maybe like the adjoining residential neighborhood and how how are we gonna design this for this specific community? And, but when we look at some of these um, projects, private projects that are required to create public open space, it's, you know, there's the tenants that are gonna be in that building, but that's not really, the <laughs> that's like that's one group and often a very privileged group um and we're asking them to design equitably for kind of the broader community and they're all like we don't know who we talk <laughs> like like they, yeah. they're having trouble wrapping their heads around that um but it really is about like that 
almost the whole city that this is their public realm mm -hmm. um, when they're required to provide these open spaces. So that like having how we can specifically guide them through that is would be really helpful. Yeah. I took Elaine's question about design professional. What 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 that did for me was it sort of made me realize, you know, design professionals to some extent are as good as their clients. And and maybe there's a way to have it not be totally dependent on the client to care about these things. A little bit what you were saying too about private versus um, public right. how how can um the design professionals come into the room with some you know baseline um equitable things and not and we need as well you know i mean the, the school people do a great job of representing their school and the open space who, who is the client for that to the city's credit when you're required to go through the city's design review program and we see that in our own work on street now education, as part of that, you have to develop a public engagement mm -hmm. strategy that isn't just about a public meeting. The, I think the difference is with the commission, we have an explicit policy that says, that treats it in a journalistic way. Who did you work with? How did you work with them? When did you work with them? Why did you work with them? But more importantly, show us the fruits of their labor. Show us. Where can I see that public engagement represented? Is it the program? Is it the use? Maybe it's an applicant, maybe it's an applied architectural solution, but just show us. And I think as stewards of the public dollar, we're empowered to do that. I don't know where that rests within, other than a client's desire, where that rests with, with private development to elevate that but totally understanding they have finance requirements, they have transactional requirements that aren't necessarily, this isn't necessarily their primary goal. I, I, I wanted to bring up another topic, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be before we go yeah, back, yeah, can I just offer one thing? I think, I think we're at this precipice where we need to start to think about equity in the same way we thought about public safety, the same way we thought about accessibility, like sustainability. sustainability, right? It took steps to in, ingrain those in there. There are so many case studies around this and it and it comes down to a value engineer. Like what are the must have versus a want to have? And I think we're still in this space, particularly on the private side where it's a, we would really like to do it, but we have to cut 10%. We have to, we are mandated to do these things. And it's unfortunate, but I think I would offer that we can't decouple at this point in time. We cannot decouple uh, a, 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 a true policy change and like real understanding of equity. And I think we're we're emerged the last few years that we have emerged in that conversation um, in 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 all aspects of it. And I think the, I think it's interesting that your case studies are more on the side of public. And I, I was actually going to ask you if you had done private development, if there were, was actual true private development that you felt had incorporated equity. Because I think the, the case studies you're showing us had many public elements to them or were nonprofit or seemed to be grant funded or something along those lines. And so I was just curious about that, like a, like a true private development that's really embraced equity in that aspect that maybe didn't, you know, I think we're seeing, we see on the design commission, because we have city policies, it is, we're getting to that point of requirement. And, it's, and we are elevating it to the same level of importance as, you know, egressing mm -hmm. to the building. Yeah, um, I, I, uh, that's a really good question. And I cannot think off of the top of my head of a private project that really put equity at the forefront. I'm not saying that does not exist. I'm sure it does. Uh, but I do think they're more likely these kind of community led or community engaged um, grant funded uh, types of projects at this point. I know some universities, higher ed, will embed equity within their internal education specifications. But um, typically that's like a very loose framework of, hey, address equity in the design. And then the architect uh, or design team might have a stakeholder charrette. Um, and I wanna go back to Danita's 
point about um, two things. I saw your chat about that equity isn't necessarily more expensive. And I agree with you, and I that's something that I share and say a lot when I'm trying to talk to design teams about adopting equity. It's really just that piece around putting the extra effort in to do that community engagement part. But in every instance, when I've spoken with teams, they've said that that has made the rest of the job like 90% easier because they're really following the path of what the community wanted. And I don't know that it necessarily resulted in a more costly project. Uh, and also, just like any other project, there's a budget that needs to be met. And so, you know, you maintain that budget. And this is always like it was the case with inclusive design and universal design. People would ask, what's the additional cost of incorporating these, these disciplines or these approaches? And, you know, it's not necessarily about cost. It's more about uh, in, embedding them in the design concept from the onset. Uh, and then I can't remember, but I think, Michael, you were talking about, you know, kind of, again, like how we encourage this adoption. And I read through your, um, your policy. Thank you for sharing the updated version. I think it's really great. And I told you this when we met. I was excited to see that, um, that the commission had something like this because that's, that's not always the case. Uh, from my lens, um, from my, just my, my perspective, I feel like it's around um, giving tools to support teams to do this work. And, you know, to Vanita's point again around making sure that community engagement is in those instances where it's really complex, how are you reaching out to the community? How are you making sure that you're tapping into um, let's say you're holding a meeting, are you holding it at di different times of the day so people who may not work a traditional nine to five can attend? Are you sharing the invite you know, broadly? Are you going into community, community spaces? Are you going into churches? Are you, going, are you really kind of doing that broad community um, engagement to get who is, who is um, truly reflective of the community in the room and part of that? And so I think there are best practices, but certainly there's a lot to still be learned around how to conduct robust community engagement. And that came up as a theme across all of the projects that I've been looking at. So, and so I think there are both best practices, but then there's also room to improve. So to the issue of our updated policy, when we were doing that, Adam brought up an attitude of word that is what I would like to spend a few minutes on, which is displacement. Uh, because displacement wasn't part of that policy yeah. before. And I think it's another thing that happens with design professionals is there's a default assumption that all projects are good projects. And sometimes it's the project that you don't do that has the most equity. <laughs> um, you know, there's a Jane, there's a uh, 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 quote, uh, uh, new ideas need old buildings. And when you modernize buildings, when you make them more expensive, you lose the artists, you lose the rehearsal you lose the cheap rent. Jill Crary, is this the voice of experience? Yeah, yeah, lots of it. Um, <laughs> and every once in a while, not knocking it down, but just going in there and band-aiding it together can be the most equitable outcome. And so I think in your circles at the beginning, there should be a circle that is about a displacement evaluation. Who are you displacing by doing this work? And, and do you reach a point in time in an evaluation where you say, this isn't the right project? I mean, that's certainly the argument that the historic preservation community keeps okay. refining, which is the greenest architecture is buildings that we rehabilitate. And then you not have, new, right. new construction is inherently, you know. Right. And just as Victoria has brought sustainability and ADA and all these things together, then, it, then that pivots to the embedded um, waste, the embedded uh, volume in, in tearing it down and pouring new concrete and transporting the debris. So, so I think that, that, that this whole displacement piece uh, is going to be one of the things that we really are going to look at more and more. Uh, because 
sometimes, yes, you know, you got to add the ramps and update the ADA to do all of that. But sometimes keeping the old building is potentially uh, a mark of the solution. Wow. <laughs> Architects never think that way, Elaine. No offense. I never met one who was like, you mean we just shouldn't do this? <laughs> Would the commissioners attending mind if I, um, we're, we have to finish in about 10 minutes. If there are 12 people attending to see if there's any yep. hands, if we could take one or two questions from people who are attending, if you raise your hand, uh, I'll keep an eye out, but we're happy to, to have people attending have a quick question or two for Victoria. I'm not seeing any, so any other commissioners? Are there any additional questions or comments? I would love to get a copy of this presentation or, or a list of your uh, suggested readings or anything like that. It's, it's very yeah. helpful. We've definitely recorded it and we'll post it on the website. Um, so we'll have that. But I think um, if you could email Victoria the presentation, that would be great too. Yeah, I, I typically um, have not been sharing the presentation only because oh. the work is ongoing. <laughs> but since we've already recorded it and it's going to be on the website, I think it's totally fine. Totally understand. Totally understand. No, no, no. It's no worries at all. I just realized I. I'm not very um, diligent about that because usually I love sharing my work, so um, I don't. I never think about it. So yeah, that's fine. Okay. What, one of the parts that I found really, really interesting was when you were talking about some of the commonly shared goals you were finding between the case studies, and that. Um, anyway, that was that was really interesting. I'm sure you're writing about this, too. So be great yeah. to just see it as you continue to um, do your research, what what more comes out of that. And I, I, I also was um, captivated by that. And I think because, you know, in our work, like we're seeing a lot of, you know, it was kind of speaking to with well, the art, for instance, sort of a, an applied mechanism. Um, and I'm really curious about things that are just like, very integrated and very embedded in the building as a whole that might be, you know, improvements to, you know, barriers that exist. And I'm assuming that some of that might come up in your study of regarding like safety and how people feel safe in a space and things like that. But I'm really curious when you get to those points of um, just like the, the pieces of the building that are sort of necessary to be there. Um, Know that I'm being really clear about what my ask is. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I, know, it, I get it. I get it. It's, it's a I mean, spatial consideration, but I think that's the part that's uh, been perplexing to me. Um, I just unmuted Vanessa Murdoch. She is um, the executive director of the Seattle Planning Commission, and she has a question. Vanessa? Thank you so much, Michael, and thank you so much for this presentation. Um, I very much appreciate being, uh, Michael, making me aware of this. Um, I do track your agendas, and so uh, I listen in as often as I can, um, and uh, very much appreciated this, and I, Victoria, very much um, understand the uh, the position you're in and not sharing um, if and when you are ready to share this presentation, I would love to share it with my with the planning commissioners who um, certainly racial equity um, in the built environment and in policy and programming is very much at the forefront as Amalia as a former planning commissioner well knows. Um, so I have a very open ended question, which is really not to be answered here and perhaps is more to be um, for us to follow up uh, commission to commission. Um, Commissioner Curry, I'm very interested in what you had to say about preservation. I think there's a really interesting conversation uh, that is evolving around preservation and future land use and equity and 
anti-displacement, and I'm just throwing a lot of words out there, and we, a number of us are grappling with um, striking that right balance. So um, I, as I said in the chat, it's a very open-ended question, and really it's more um, an invitation to continue to dialogue with the design commissioners um, and Victoria, I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. Um, and, and I don't want to put you on the spot because there is no, no one answer. Uh, I'm, I'm very interested in the crux of that conversation. So thank you. What can someone, because we can't see the chat in the room. Can someone reiterate the I'm question? I'm trying to see if I can find the chair. Or, because I am a lot here. There's chair. Um, the, that Vanessa, she said she put a question in the chat. Oh, she just said, can I um, make a comment? She just oh, wanted to be able to oh, make a comment. Oh, oh. The only chat I see is Ruby. Never mind. Equitable design spaces to manage. No, she just wanted to make a comment. Oh, okay. You know the, the conversation about saving old buildings. It was also flips in the other direction when you go to landmarks, boards, and other places, is you get to beg them to say, if you help me open this building up, if you let us make more interventions than you might be comfortable with, then the building has a new life. And otherwise it might not. <laughs> and so um, we've successfully argued that. And, and so that's what I mean by it works both ways. Everybody has to give a little bit to make that work, but there can be win wins from the preservation perspective too. Because these buildings get kept, maybe not like uh, museum pieces, but they get kept. I had another question for Victoria. When you did your survey of the different, um, you know, programs that are out there that are measuring equity, which was really interesting to see, there, you referred to something as, um, where is it, full framework. And I, I wasn't sure what full framework meant. Yeah. Sorry, that's just um, a way that I was saying that in our, the way that we have design guidance is often in these larger building rating systems that address, let's, let's look at LEED, right? It, it addresses a lot of different concepts, but within it, there are like the social equity pilot credits. So in my review, I didn't review the full framework of LEAD. I reviewed the subset of that that is intended to address equity. So that's that's what I meant by that. Is okay. that helpful? Yeah, thank you. Okay. And then I just wanted to loop back really quickly on the preservation piece. And I don't, I can't address it um, necessarily from like a planning perspective, but I did want to offer that I am actually coming up across, coming up against this often in my research, where the what the community wants is actually in conflict with what um, is required by historic preservation. And as an example, um, in the women's building, it was required to maintain a um, a chapel, and the chapel was. Uh, largely rejected by the design advisory. They didn't want it. It things around religion and it just, it had a bad connotation and they wanted to essentially get rid of the chapel, but because of historic preservation rules, they had to keep the chapel. So that was an example of that every community member talked about, like we didn't want that chapel, but like we needed to have it. And then on the flip side, they wanted to keep, um, so prior to it being a women's correctional facility, it was actually a YMCA. And so there was a pool in, in the building, like on like the like second to last um, top floor. And they wanted to keep that pool and keep it open to community members and have that be like a space for, you know, joy and gathering and all of this, but they couldn't because of um, um, historic preservation and kind of like not wanting to, it wasn't structurally like the way that it needed to be or something like that. So. I'm running up against that a lot, and it's going to be something that I'm going to pull out from each of my projects because I'm sure that there are other instances. Yeah. And some of the some of the things that I've been hearing about as well, but you know, some of the um, you know, for instance, like um, 
we've got some historic neighborhoods in Seattle and the, you know, the time period that is being sort of celebrated for, you know, that preservation is, you know, we think about the displacement issue of, um, <laughs> you know, we're sort of celebrating like a white settlement on, mm -hmm. right. you know, um, you know, like Duwamish land or, you know, a, a local land source. And so I think there's a lot of questions regarding equity in that as well. And then to have these, these guidelines. So that was such an interesting example, um, Victoria. So we are just out of time. I have a number of commissioners that have to transition to yet another yeah. meeting. So I'm going to, we're going to close it here, Victoria. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And spending sorry, part of your time with us today. I hope it was useful. Certainly, it was for us. Um, and I want to thank the, the the people from the city who listened in. Thank you for spending time today. I hope you found the conversation as enriching as we did. Uh, Benita, anything you want to uh, close with? Um, I think you said it all, Michael. That that was a great presentation. Thank you for coming. Um, it's, it's, we'll look forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we don't have to come back yeah. So <laughs> maybe yeah. this is a preview of your defense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, thank you so much for having me. I was thrilled to join. And um, yeah, I look forward to keeping in touch and seeing if there's any way uh, I can support your work. And uh, yeah, just seeing what, what's next. Thanks, Victoria. Thank you. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank Commissioner. You. We Thanks. are done for today. Nice to meet you, does not it? Yeah. yeah. And I just stopped the recording, so.